Good afternoon. My name is Joshua Stallings. I'm the Deputy Director of, of the Division of, the Federal, of Federal Home Bank Regulation at the FHFA. It's hard to believe that just six weeks ago, we kicked off the second phase of our Federal, federal Home Loan Bank at 100 initiative. Today's roundtable, our sixth or seventh, depending on how you're counting, will cover membership eligibility, collateral requirements, and safety and soundness. Let me start by extending a warm welcome to our roundtable participants and to all who are watching on our live stream. In prior roundtables, we discussed the bank's role in supporting affordable and sustainable housing in supporting the unique needs of rural and financially vulnerable communities, in supporting native and tribal lands, and in efforts to address the racial homeownership gap. In all these discussions, we also discussed trade-offs and how the effort and how the effect of these efforts uh, are and, and, and the effect of these efforts on safety and soundness. As I mentioned before, today we will be we will we will ask questions about the Federal Home Loan Bank System membership. I'd like to emphasize that FHFA is not taking a position at this time on what membership eligibility ought to be and what, if any, changes should be made. We will ask our roundtable participants to provide their best thinking on the types of entities that should be eligible for bank membership and what some of the key eligibility criteria ought to be, and how membership should tie back to the mission and purpose of the federal home loan banks. We will further be asking our roundtable participants to offer their perspectives on the question of how. We expect to bring to light differing views and to delve deeper into some key points where there could be disagreement. And we hope to glean new insights from questions that you on the round table may ask each other this afternoon. The feedback we, will, we receive will inform any recommendations and actions as we uh, continue our initiative moving forward. And I want to be clear that no suggestion or idea should be considered off the table. That said, while we are open to hearing bold ideas, I also want to hear recommendations that can be implemented in the short term that can achieve meaningful and positive impacts. With that, I want to again thank our roundtable participants and all of our stakeholders for their continued uh, interest in this initiative. Let me turn it over to Amy, who will, rev review, who will review the rules of engagement. Amy. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Bogdan. I'm the Associate Director of Regulatory Policy and Programs in FHFA's Division of Federal Home Loan Bank Regulation. I am joined by my colleague, Chris Boslin, our Chief External Risk Officer. <coughs> we will be moderating the discussion today. We expect and hope that we will have an open and engaging discussion. No recommendations or views should be considered off the table, as Joshua just said. And we encourage you to offer differing views about some important questions that we will be covering this afternoon. We also want this to be orderly. And as such, we'd ask that everyone uh, turn your name placards like so to indicate you know, that you have, would you like to make a comment or respond to a question? Um, at, at some points, we will ask people in turn um, to, and also to ensure that everyone has a chance to speak and that we cover every discussion topic. If someone is going long, we may at some points interject to keep the conversation moving forward. Second, the review is meant to bring forward the views and reasoned perspectives of federal home loan bank system stakeholders and to highlight areas for future consideration. We ask that you not limit your responses to what would be possible under current conditions. Third, we will have a break halfway, about halfway through today's event. And finally, for the benefit of those participants on the live stream, the roundtable participants have been given a set of prompts that we will reference during the course of this afternoon's discussion. We will also have a disclaimer that we need to make you aware of, and I have to read this one verbatim. We have organized this roundtable to obtain your input on the mission of the federal home loan banks including input on several specific questions that were sent to you prior to today's meeting. 
During today's session, FHFA will not discuss the status or timing of any potential rulemaking. If FHFA does decide to engage in a rulemaking on any matters discussed today, this meeting would not take the place of any public comment process. The rulemaking document would establish the public comment process and you would need to submit your comments, if any, in accordance with the submission instructions in that document. FHFA may summarize the feedback gathered at today's session in a future rulemaking document if we determine that a summary would be useful to explain the basis of a rulemaking. Anything said in this meeting, and that also includes reactions, nodding, eye rolling, uh, should not be construed as binding on or a final decision by the director of FHFA or FHFA staff. Any questions we may have are focused on understanding your views and do not indicate a policy or legal position. Participants in today's roundtable may have a financial interest, whether direct or indirect, on outcomes that may affect the federal home loan banks in their businesses. As Joshua mentioned, today's roundtable will be live streamed and on FHFA's website, excuse me, live streamed on FHFA's website and video recorded. FHFA may also prepare a transcript of today's session, which would include the names of all speakers and the organizations they represent, if any. The recording and any transcripts prepared will be posted on FHFA's website and YouTube channel, along with any materials being presented today or otherwise submitted in, in uh, conjunction with the roundtable. With that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Amy. You know, you're supposed to do that in one breath. Um, I, I'm, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for participating in this. Uh, it's, I think, our sixth or seventh, as Joshua said. Um, and after a number of roundtables that were, people were very passionate about, I'm looking forward to having an issue where people don't feel very strongly about uh, for today's <laughs> topic. Um, now, obviously, this is an issue that's garnered, garnered a lot of attention, at least since the 2016 regulation put out by the Finance Board, but, uh, for, excuse me, the Finance Agency, I'm dating myself, um, but uh, we also, the agency also put out a, an RFI several years ago. Um, so we know um, folks have, have strong feelings about this, and it's obviously important to this uh, to this overall FHLB at 100 initiative. Um, I will say that obviously questions of membership, the juicy stuff, most of the juicy stuff is really outside of FHFA's regulatory powers and ambit. There are certain things we might, may or may not do, um, but as uh, picking up on what Amy said, um, for purposes of the discussion, particularly big picture thinking, let's you know, we can kind of ignore the Bank Act uh, for now, and let's go back to square one and talk about policy rationales uh, for the banks, for the systems, for the membership, and so forth. Um, we do plan, the director does plan to make recommendations where appropriate, uh, you know, where they require congressional action. Um, but as again, as Joshua said, we're looking for both things that, that may be big picture, but also things that we, we, we can implement. So along the way, feel free to refer to that, but don't necessarily feel bound by, um, you know, the, the current statute. Um, uh, then lastly, I'll just say uh, the last part of the disclaimer is in discussing membership, uh, and, and, and Joshua talked about, you know, we're interested in your view. For those of you arguing uh, for uh, entities that are not currently members, um, uh, you know, uh, I know others will feel on the other side, uh, you shouldn't necessarily feel that just by asking the question that there's any preset determination, uh, you know, if we're, if, uh, uh, you know, if we're asking how could we let a certain kind of membership member in safely and soundly, that doesn't mean we decided to do that. We're just trying to get uh, people's best thoughts on that. So uh, with that, I will say for folks at, uh, on the streaming, we had an opportunity to, to meet beforehand, but for, 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 uh, for everyone else, I'm going to ask everyone to go around and introduce yourselves. Um, uh, it would also be helpful to identify any involvement you currently have or in a, in a prior uh, uh, role with the home loan banks, and particularly for those who are perhaps advocating on behalf of new types of members, if you have a, 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 an affiliation that would obviously be relevant to that, it would be helpful to, uh, this isn't illegal, we're not going to make you swear to it, but it would just be helpful from an informative perspective. So Jim, why don't we start with you down there and we'll work our way around. Thanks. 
Good afternoon. I'm Jim Vance. I am co-chief investment officer of the uh, Fort Washington Investment Company, which is the investment arm of the Western Southern Life Insurance Company, referred to as uh, the Western Southern Financial Group. We're a life insurance company, mutually organized, founded in 1888, uh, Fortune 500. Uh, in my role there, I'm responsible for the entire uh, public equities portfolio and uh, private equities portfolio. I also oversee mergers and acquisitions and uh, I oversee our investments in strategic venture capital and fintech and insurtech firms, which is also gonna be discussed. Um, at one point in time, uh, Western Southern did own a bank, Fort Washington Savings. We got out of the banking market uh, after uh, the great financial crisis, but we also had about a uh, uh, close to a billion asset bank with most of its operate, uh, branches in um, uh, North Carolina. Uh, I am also the uh, vice chair of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati. And um, in my uh, capacity prior to being chief investment officer uh, for 25 years, I was treasurer of Western Southern. I formed the membership for six insurance companies to, in the Federal Home Loan Bank system. Um, uh, in the Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati, <coughs> Federal Home Loan Bank of Indianapolis, and also the uh, Federal Home Loan Bank of, of uh, New York. Uh, and then recently, uh, on the fintech side, we uh, acquired Fabric Life, which again is very much uh, of interest at this about how uh, fintechs and startups could also be considered with their housing mission. Good afternoon. I'm Joan Broadhead. I'm the Chief Strategic Initiatives Officer for Community First Fund. We are a 30-year-old uh, CDFI, Community Development Financial Institutions. We're based in Pennsylvania and cover about 16 counties in uh, the eastern part of the state. Um, we have been a member of the Federal Home Loan Bank, um, I'm thinking about 10 years. Um, we were one of the first uh, two or three CDFIs in the state um, that were um, able to have membership. Uh, we worked very closely with the, um, with the bank, as well as um, at a national level, advocating for CDFIs to become members um, prior to the legislation changing. And I was sitting on the national board of the Opportunity Finance Network, which is the oversight and, and trade association of um, CDFIs during the time in which we were advocating for um, the addition of CDFIs. Uh, and um, I would say the other thing we have, while um, not directly related to the, to the Federal Home Loan Bank, is that over the last um, several years, we've been creating and we have chartered a de novo credit union for our institution, um, which complements the commercial and small business lending uh, that we have in our CDFI. Um, this uh, gives us the opportunity to open um, into the consumer market and uh, we plan to have residential mortgages as a key pr product for us um, as the regulations <laughs> move on and we can add that product. Uh, we are focused on urban communities uh, and predominantly work in low-income communities. We've been identified as a low-income development um, credit union and we are also a minority depository institution. So we're looking at how um, we can continue to leverage our activity um, and access capital markets um, so that we can drive additional financing and you know, responsible and affordable financing to low-income communities and individuals. My name is Lori Goodman. I'm an institute fellow at the, um, at the Housing Finance Policy Center at the Urban Institute. The Urban Institute is a Washington, D.C.-based um, think tank I founded the housing policy, the Housing Finance Policy Center at Urban in 2013, believing that um, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. Um, so, by trying to democratize um, data, I hope to um, facilitate better public policy. The, better public policy decisions. Um, I'm also on several boards, including the board of a mortgage REIT and the board of a independent mortgage banker. Um, I, the positions that I'm gonna be advocating today way predate any board membership activity.
My name is Anand Solanki. I'm the Chief Financial Officer at Citadel Credit Union. Um, our credit union was founded about 90 years ago, and we serve everyone within the six county area in southern, southeastern Pennsylvania, including the Philadelphia County. Um, our, uh, our balance sheet com is composed of over half real estate loans, so we are heavily uh, enabling uh, mortgage lending and housing affordability. Um, and I'm here as a member of the Pittsburgh FHLB. Hi, I'm Pat McInerney. I'm with Freedom Mortgage Company, a special advisor to the chairman and owner of Freedom Mortgage, Mr. Middleman. Uh, I've had 38 years in this industry, um, it, most of that at the Bank of New York, but I spent seven years at Everbank, where we were a large uh, federal home loan bank, an active member. Um, and then spent 15 years at, 14 years at Deutsche Bank, and I led a project where we assessed the, um, the ability of Deutsche to join the federal home loan bank system and then set up the involvement of Deutsche in the system through the use of an insurance company um, in 2009, 2008 and 2009. Uh, during my tenure at Deutsche, I was also very closely involved with a number of the federal home loan banks, Deutsche provides a number of services to, to the system and to its members. And uh, you know, we I worked actively with the leadership of several federal home loan banks on issues ranging from membership to uh, to new products. Um, and my responsibilities here were also had a degree of, of international activity and I had the opportunity to see how the housing finance system operates outside the U.S. in some great level of detail. Um, the, at Freedom, we are one of the largest providers of mortgage loans in the U.S. We are the largest servicer of loans insured by the Veterans Administration. We are one of the largest originators and services of servicers for uh, FHA insured loans, um, and in general, one of the largest lenders in the U.S. So we bring to that the view of you know how does the how do the providers of this type of financing have access to. Um, can have some access to the system. Thank you. I'm Julianne Thurlow. I'm president of Reading Cooperative Bank in Reading, Massachusetts. We're a mutual bank. Um, we were founded in 1886, so just a couple of years older than you, Jim. Um, so um, I've um, we've been a member of the Boston Fed for 25 years, I believe it is. Um, I am also um, serving um, this year's chair elect of the American Bankers Association, and I also serve on the board of the Mass Development. Um, finance agency in Massachusetts. Um, so um, at my role at Reading Cooperative Bank, we do, um, I love how you explained your portfolio. 50% um, of the loans that we write are for home mortgages, um, and the remainder of the portfolio is commercial lending, but predominantly for housing purposes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Byron Boston. I'm president of Dynex Capital. Dynex is a 34-year-old uh, um, mortgage REIT. Our entire existence is focused on financing housing-related and real estate assets. <clears throat> we have probably financed every type of asset in the housing universe, from servicing to uh, uh, residential loans, multifamily housing over 34 years. Loans have matured on our balance sheet. So I want to emphasize that we are long-term holders of the risk. So when you think about the housing finance system, some originate, some service, but some of us have to hold and be able to manage the long-term risk of the assets. So assets come on our balance sheet, and in many situations, they uh, stay there over the years. Um, my background, I've got a long background in this space. I started as a commercial lending officer with Chemical Bank in 1981, became a mortgage-backed securities trader in 1986 with First Boston. In 1997, I joined Freddie Mac in their uh, portfolio in 2004. I started my first company, which was a mortgage REIT, did an IPO with the New York Stock Exchange, sold it. And then this company, Dynex Capital, was a turnaround over the last 15 years. We have rebuilt Dynex's uh, balance sheet. And what's fascinating is Dynex was one of the earlier innovators in the non-agency um, mortgage universe in, in the late 80s and early 1990s. Um, fascinating to see the assets that they financed from, from uh, anything from a, a single family home to a uh, manufactured housing, uh, to uh, to multifamily, huge light tech lender between 1988 and 1998. So our entire existence focuses on housing, the American population. Um, we enjoy it. I enjoy it uh, personally. Um, we find it uh, just a fascinating role 
uh, to play uh, in the American housing finance system. Many talk about their purpose. Dynex, we don't have to, as I say, go, to go away for a retreat to figure out what our purpose happens to be. We know what it is, we're focused, and we have been for 34 years. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ed. And obviously, we have a tremendous breadth uh, and depth of expertise here. Uh, it's purely coincidental, I'm sure, that there's representatives from across the spectrum, just uh, how these things work out. No, um, but I think we're going to have a great uh, discussion today, so thank you all. Um, you know, at the first roundtable, which was focused on the mission of the home loan bank system, um, you know, we noted that, you know, Congress has seen fit to refer to a mission uh, to the extent that it has a dual mission of providing liquidity to member institutions, uh, in, engage in housing finance, and then uh, community economic development. Uh, has not provided a lot more clarity on that. It's never defined those. It's, uh, and so that was part, that's part of uh, the deliberations on, on, under this initiative. Uh, but one of the, uh, several of the participants at that first roundtable made the point when we were asking them what do they think the mission should be, they said, well, uh, you know, that actually, the, excuse me, the, the issue of who, who should be in came up uh, uh, as members, and they said, well, you can't really decide who the, uh, the members should be um, as a normative matter unless you know what the purpose of the system is and what the mission is. So um, I know this really isn't the focus of, of, of this per se. I know m most of you in your written comments are prepared to talk more about the specifics. Um, but before we get into that, I thought we'd just go around and, and those of you, you know, and ask, you know, again, blue skying this or blank sheeting, however you want to phrase, phrase it, um, you know, what is the mission or what should the mission be uh, of, of the home loan bank system. So, um, I, Julie, I'm sorry to do this to you, but since you, you are one of the bankers on the, on, the, on the panel, let's start with you as somebody who uses the system currently, and then we'll, we'll go from there. I'm sure. Um, as, as I look at our relationship with the Federal Home Loan Bank and speaking from that perspective, um, the um, stability uh, that the Federal Home Loan Bank system provides to community banks to allow the continuous flow of credit. Um, depositors are fickle. Um, they don't tell you in advance when they need the money. They don't tell you their story. Um, but um, deposit flows in and out when you consider what happened recently. Um, with all the stimulus that came in, banks were flooded um, with deposits. I, have, I can um, share with you, and I don't think it's any surprise that we are seeing significant deposit outflows at this time. And so our relationship with the Federal Home Loan Bank system right now is one of our closest relationships. We speak with them on a daily basis um, or connect with them on a daily basis. So it really is ensuring that liquidity is available so that credit can continue continue to flow to our communities. Okay, thanks. Um, Lori, do you have anything to add on this? Yes, um, so um, I mean, I'd like to re-echo everything that um, Julie says, basically, basically the purpose of the home loan banks is to provide liqu reliable liquidity to support housing finance and community development. They have to provide this through the cycle. There is no time when the home loan banks are more critical than during periods of stress. No one can forget the critical role that they provided in 2008 when advances ballooned to a trillion dollars or the critical role that they provided early in COVID. So, you know, the idea is to, of the home loan banks is to prevent liquidity crisis by funding solvent institutions who are critical to the housing finance system. Thanks. Myron, do you have uh, some thoughts on what the mission should be? Yes, yeah, sure. I, I'm a big advocate of the U.S. housing finance system, but we should really understand that what makes us unique within the global system. We're bringing capital from around the world through the United States to the, to the American homeowner. The only way it arrives here is because of the real creditworthiness of the U.S. government, of which you are uh, a, a facilita facilitator of this type of capital reaching to the American homeowner. So as we sit here, this is a big moment in history. Um, in my 40 years investing in mortgage assets or, or lending, um, there's never been a, a large a time period where a large government entity has not been a net buyer on a long-term basis of those assets. It was either Freddie or Fannie or it's now been the Federal Reserve Bank. And at this point, Federal Reserve Bank does not want those assets. Now that'll flow through whether it's, it's a security that's on their balance sheet or it flows through the whole loans, it will flow through the system if they were to choose to um, re relieve themselves of all those assets at one point. Someone has to own the assets. Someone around this table will own or some other entity will own these assets. I asked the question, what can the Federal Home Loan Bank's uh, system do to help facilitate the long-term ownership of U.S. housing financing assets. That is a very important good for the American population. So with that in mind, 
um, I believe that uh, the home loan bank system should be focused on those entities who have the ability to hold the assets over the long term. You're a risk manager. These are very risky assets. Mm -hmm. Who would make a 30-year loan to anyone that they can prepay at any point in time? It's a very risky asset, but we've done it very well as a country. And the type of financing and stability that the home loan banks can provide can play a huge role. So I'm a little bit above just what are the exact requirements. Mm -hmm. Let's have the home loan bank system think about their role today, which is very different than it's been in the past because the government entities that have played a large role, large balance sheet, Freddie, Fannie, and now the Fed, they're now exiting. None of us have been in a system where either one of these three entities has not played a role as a net buyer of these assets. So you sit on a, 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 a phenomenal bed of financing. Liquidity is extremely important. At Dynex Capital, we're experts in managing the risk, and I'm sure at some of your other institutions, you have expertise in managing the risk. 100% of our assets are focused here. So I'd like to see how, ask a bigger question, how can the home loan bank system facilitate the assets that are now on the Federal Reserve balance sheet to be held by private capital. Thanks, um, Jim. Uh, as somebody who represents, somebody who's been it from the beginning, um, the insurance companies, what do you have to say? Yeah, uh, I appreciate that you're asking this. Is I am really quite comfortable with the phrasing of the two-tier mandate. And I think it's very analogous to the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, the Two-tier mandate for me, I slight nuance. I'd say first, exactly what we said, liquidity. I think liquidity of the system. I think it's timely we're meeting here. Most of us at some point will watch It's a Wonderful Life in the next two weeks. <laughs> and the whole movie's premised on the Bailey Brothers building and loan company. And they have a run on the bank because the, their deposits can't match the home loans that they put in uh, the park that they were building all the houses on. So. You know, going back to 1932, liquidity and the key points of the system, I echo what Byron was saying. So the liquidity of the system, I think, is the forefront. Same as the Federal Reserve, the key thing is inflation and money supply. Then there's the idea about what then was the secondary mandate. And I would nuance it more toward housing than jumping right to affordable housing. Because the housing market, Zillow says the US housing markets may be 40 trillion in assets. Entire treasury bond markets, 17 trillion. In Assets. It's a massive market. All housing contributes to affordable housing because it increases the supply. Somebody has to sell a house to buy another house uh, and through the chain. Now, we can also focus a lot of assets on affordable housing. So I really support all the initiatives within CDFIs and everything that people do. But I think the massive housing market and echoing where Byron was at, that's what we're really focusing on. Same way that the Federal Reserve second mandate, unemployment. But you need to make sure that if you, if you focus too much on GDP, you get too high of inflation. If you get too off on the housing market, you could screw up the liquidity portion of that. Uh, but having said that, affordability is important in the same way that the Federal Reserve, when looks at unemployment, looks at minority unemployment and um, the underserved, and also focuses on GDP. We also say, when the uh, Chairman Powell speaks, he says, there's only so far monetary policy can go. We need to think of that in terms of housing. There's only so much that this is a funding matter and a, and a matter for the Federal Home Loan Bank. It's a massive market. It's very complex. So it's not necessarily all a funding matter. Congress plays an important role. The uh, Health, and Human, uh, Health and Urban Development uh, Office does, uh, FHA. So um, the difference between the Federal Home Loan Bank system and the Federal Reserve, we try to have 10% of our income go to affordable housing. The Federal Reserve doesn't take the income off all those T-bills and agency securities and try to put it into uh, paying for the education of the unemployed or other initiatives. So we're already sort of supporting it. So I feel very comfortable in that lens, that, that two-tier mandate, and sort of in that tiering structure. Thanks. They also have the advantage that they can create bank reserves, but that, that we, don't, we don't have. But, um, but I did write down all I needed to know about banking I learned from It's a Wonderful Life, so thank you for that. Um, Anand, you have to get your card turned around. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I also particularly like the double mandate um, and liquidity. I feel like, uh, as, as, as my fellow panelists have said, um, as, a, as an integral uh, entity, let's say, between the FHLB, the Freddie, Fannie, all of the organizations combined uh, under the FHFA mandate have 
focused on liquidity, and I would even say that they're very successful in providing liquidity to the market, as we've seen in the recent couple of years, and even not just in boom times, there is plenty of liquidity to go around, but also especially, uh, like Julie said, in in tough times as well, FHLB is the uh, sometimes this, the sole provider of liquidity for the likes of the Cyril Credit Union, uh, as you know, any other uh, insured depository institution. The second part is where I feel like, uh, you know, going to your question about where should uh, the FHFA be focused on. Um, as a stated mandate, I think it is a good mandate as a execution or, you know, getting more done. Um, I feel like there is opportunity on the community economic development angle to it. And what I mean by that as, as, as an insured depository institution, particularly a credit union who serves many underserved, and we see folks from all, all walks of life. And what we see is that in addition to providing someone with the means, say, in affordable housing, um, a lot more impactful would be education and awareness, financial awareness, financial education. So, you know, how does that relate to FHLB? Um, I, I don't know what the, the best execution could be, but as an idea, uh, for example, for members like us, if the uh, FHLB were to have certain requirements for community education, uplifting, awareness, camps, such that you, because there's a lot of able-bodied and able-minded folks that are underserved. And I don't think it would, the, you know, the, the programs and, you know, Pittsburgh FHLB and all the other FHLB, there are a lot of programs and grants and, and, and such that are going to these able-bodied people that, and then there are certain others who may not be uh, able-bodied. I think the funding and the grants are, are probably better going to, in a sort of a reverse priority of, you know, who needs the most, and then, I know we do that, but, there is a segment of the population that would certainly benefit from more education, more awareness that somehow if FHLB were to include as a, a requirement of uh, some sort of a membership, that I would think would go a long way in addition to the programs. So capacity building not just for the members, uh, but also for the members to, to pass on to the communities that they serve. Uh, fair enough. Joan, I see you have your card. So I would agree with the liquidity, um, and I don't need to say anything more than um, my panel members have said, but I'd like to talk about the community development aspect, and particularly um, mentioned earlier the racial gap um, for wealth and the racial gap in home ownership um, without going into too much um, data. Um, the, the communities that we work in here in eastern Pennsylvania, well, Philadelphia is the, one of the largest um, cities in the country with the highest level of, of poverty, um, just about an hour away from here, a city of Reading, Pennsylvania, is actually this one of the most um, poor small cities in the country with a population of about 80,000. Um, in some of the community, parts of the community, almost 50% of the census tracts is at poverty level. So, you know, our focus um, is trying to drive um, good quality credit to individuals who want to become one of homeowners, one of the ways in which to try and really lessen that gap. And I think the Federal Home Loan Bank is uniquely kind of situated if in the mission it's stated that community development is, um, and economic development is a portion of it. I think it keeps the focus there, it keeps the accountability there, and I think there's a, a great way for people to um, be creative these days in finding ways to not only help home ownership, but really build um, family wealth and, you know, family uh, well, wealth, excuse me, uh, well-being uh, in their financial services. And um, the home ownership training, uh, the home buyer training is a big part of that, um, but really keeping pe people in homes that they can afford and possibly pass that wealth on to the next generation, which is how we know um, wealth has really been transferred in this country. Yeah, that's actually a re recurring theme in these, uh, uh, the, the need, and I think maybe, Jim, you, you, you addressed this as well, uh, moving beyond the grant. I mean, the grants are important, but uh, the sort of the, the activities of the banks uh, could perhaps do more in the space of the commercial business uh, with the members to, to advance things on a, a much larger scale. Um, 
Pat, everyone, okay, I was gonna say, everyone else has spoken and you, you wanna uh, get you in here. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think it's, to, to reiterate what every panel member's made, is the dual mission makes, you know, it makes perfect sense. The challenge with the dual mission is it's not very specific, and it, and it becomes a real challenge as to what that dual mission can mean. You know, what I turn the focus to is the role that the Federal Home Bank has played in providing a reliable source of liquidity to the U.S. housing system over 90 years and to try to give that in perspective of what's evolved in that system over that time period, right? The Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, the, the Federal Home Loan Bank system was created before the FDIC was created, right? It existed before banks as we know them today existed, right? There was no such thing as an insured depository or a federally insured depository when the, uh, when the system was created. Um, and what's evolved in the U.S. has been this extraordinarily unique system to provide long-term, 30-year fixed-rate financing to almost everyone, right, every, every, uh, it, 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 and Byron had mentioned this, it is a very uniquely American uh, scenario, and, and the Federal Home Loan Bank along the way has evolved in providing liquidity towards that system. But the system's evolved a lot since then. Um, you know, the, FHA followed the Federal Home Loan Bank system. The VA followed it by, what, 12 years, right? Things that we think of as Ginny May followed it by 42 years, or is that 42 years? Or let's do our math. Anyone with me, 52 years? Uh, uh, anyway, 36 years. Anyway, so 1968. And Fannie and Freddie came up in the 1970s, right? So these are the kind of institutions that have evolved under the lifespan of the federal home loan bank system and has, you know, during that time period, the act and the amendments to the act have expanded membership, but the act themselves has never restricted membership. Um, and if you look at that language, right, there are institutions named in the act that we, I think, all have a tough time defining what they are today, right? Building and loans, there's a homeowner something or other. I don't even know what that means, but, right, I'm not sure how we would define that today. But it was clearly that even in the statement that President Hoover made in announcing the act, he reads off this list of institutions and then says, et cetera, right? The intent was to provide to provide something that would provide flexibility to support an evolving housing finance system. So we think that that is probably core to what that mission is to, uh, that uh, continuing in that way is core to what the mission should be of the, of the system. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, so as we tiptoe our way to the main event here, um, you know, we talked about mission, it raises the question as we get to the, the types of entities that, I mean, uh, how important is it, though, that, that we have a test or tests for who could be in? I mean, you were talking about et cetera, which suggests an open thing, but I'm curious, what, what do you all feel should be the or the, the test or the tests for membership as to uh, how, do we, how do we assess achievement of that mission or contribution to the mission? Um, is it collateral? Is it assets? Is it income percentage? Um, and I'll just uh, I'll see if anyone has wants to weigh in on this. And okay, you, so, so for the act has the meets test, right? Make to make perfect sense, or to makes test. I'm sorry, to make housing loans. How that's been defined in allowing members in has been quite broad, right? You made a loan, or you hold a loan, you pass the makes test, um, or it had. Mm -hmm. Various times well, just to, I mean, to, to Byron's point earlier, there's, there's, is there a difference between making and holding, and, and should that be a relevant consideration? So, uh, I, 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 th I think it is important uh, that um, that that requirement be to, to to either make or hold. Right? It is providing liquidity to the system, and in that is either to make or hold in a material way. Right? Uh, I think that that's to central to what that should be. Um, and I do believe our, uh, the interpretation in the past has actually been quite broad. And does it? it I, I, but yes, I, the, the, this broad or the ability to either make or hold and to have that as a significant part of your business, I think, is important for a member. Hi, Julie. 
So I would add to the make and hold um, capitalized and regulated um, so that there is something to back up. We talk, I know um, we'll be talking about collateral later on. Um, and the safety and the integrity of the system is based on that safety um, and also the checks and balances. Um, when we consider what just happened um, with FTX, um, we, um, there are um, very different standards with which certain um, organizations manage themselves and their organizations. So making sure that anybody who enters um, has been, um, is capitalized and regulated. And I would also say that um, they are, um, they are um, beholden to CRA. Um, as far as the Community Reinvestment Act, that's a very good metric of whether or not you're meeting the needs of the financial community of the community with which you derive your um, your wealth. Thanks. Yeah, I noticed that in your your written submissions about the CRA, and so I'd like to put a pin in that and come back to that. But I know that Byron was was waiting to to weigh in on the. Yeah, I think there's a. If I were again, I'm going to always be speaking broadly from the housing finance system of the U.S. I think it's a huge advantage of our country. Do not take this for granted. It's not all over the world. So I'm going to start with a hierarchy. And if, and if we use a chart at Dynax, happy to share it. On the right hand is where the money comes from. There's no one who has money. You know how many people have money? It's the saver. That who has money. So we bring money through the saver through those who buy our common stock or buy our preferred stock. But if I were to think from your seat, I'm going to sit and say, okay, let's have a hierarchy. The most important person you need well, it's not a true, it's not the most important, it's the various players. But you've got to have someone to hold the long-term risk. A 30-year mortgage, whether it is in loan form or whether it's in securities form, and one thing that has changed, I will introduce you Dynex Capital as a long-term lender in this space, but if you look at our balance sheet today, it's all securities, because that's where we're choosing to take risks. They're more liquid, and in this day environment, we need more liquidity. So I would like to, to, to just make sure we approach this from a broad perspective that takes into account what does the housing finance system look like today and really prioritize long-term holders of the risk with the skill sets to actually manage that risk through multiple environments. I would also urge you to think about the world is changing and the world of risk, say now for the next 20 to 30 years may look very different than the last 20 to 30 years. Yeah, okay, but, uh, and yeah, we'll get to uh, Jim, you're, you're next, and then we can get to Lori. But just on the, so if I hear what you're saying, you're talking about, would it be fair to characterize that as, a, as an asset test, if you will? That is, regardless of whether it's in securities form or, or mortgage loan form, form or yeah. loan form, but. There should be an asset test to, to ensure that this entity is truly playing a role that's aligned with the, with the home loan bank system's mission of housing in America. They're really truly playing a role. Because you, well, here's what's going to happen for sure. You brought up FTX. Look, the, the, there's a lot of money in our financial system, always has been. You're gonna, have good, you're gonna have bad players, all right? So let's just assume that right off the bat. So you'll have to start with the appropriate requirements. Someone will try to look like they have a tent that says housing on the outside and there's something else on the inside. So. Let's just start with that perspective. I'd like to say everyone's wonderful and kind and nice and honest, but that's not the way the system works. So yes, there should be an asset test that this entity is truly focused on housing-related assets and helping facilitate the housing finance system. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, so on the, on the membership uh, criteria, I think we're echoing, but I, uh, I like what Robire was going. I think. We start out with the phrase housing mission, which I think is important, we use, we use housing, but I think there's, going to where Byron is, I think there's quickly another test within that is, you know, saying housing, I think most of us kind of jump to, you don't build a housing community without a surveyor laying out the meets and bounds, but I don't think that's really meeting the housing test of saying, well, we can't even start to get the lots to build the houses if it wasn't surveyed, but it doesn't really have financial assets. And my son works for a housing company, he builds houses and community developments. He's at Lowe's and Home Depot 90% of the week because something wasn't delivered. Most of those projects need, you know, plumbing products, roofing, drywall. We're not looking to try to get Home Depot and Lowe's in there. So this is where we're going, where Byron is. I think there is sort of an, a nexus something around financial assets. So you're, you are sort of shifting. It is a federal finance agency. It is sort of the financial assets that sort of kind of emerges out of that. You need sort of an asset to participate in finance, and that's where it sort of 
becomes a chicken and egg a bit into the collateral discussion. Um, sort of going also to where uh, Julianne was saying too is, uh, I sort of like look at this a little bit like a lifeboat. You know, we're gonna all talk a little bit here about membership. Uh, I kind of feel like a insurance company here since 1932, we're in the lifeboat already. Uh, I don't want to be the person in the Titanic saying you can't come on. I'd love everybody to be on. But I'm sure I don't want insurance companies outside the lifeboat as a result of this. And I only want people in the lifeboat that aren't going to capsize the lifeboat. So from that point, then I kind of go to the next wave of criteria. And you know, if I look at the ones who are already in and why the system has worked, I do think maintaining transparent and audited financials. So there needs to be the ability to look at S similarly disclosed information for comparability and comportability. Um, you have to maintain strong capitalization. The, uh, there needs to be a sufficient, now it goes also, I'm not missing where Byron's at and actually the ultimate owning of the assets, but that's the asset side of the balance sheet. You also have to look at the net worth side of the balance sheet, just say what is, what's the sufficiency of capital? So we need to get our arms around what's the sufficiency of capital and that sufficiency of capital for critical mass. Um, and if you're gonna look at capital, that's the advantage of looking at state and federally regulated. Because those have looked at capital, looked at risk over 50 or 100 years, over depressions and tech crises and, and the RTC crisis and continental Illinois and all these different great financial crises, looked at all these and learned from those experiences and said, okay, this is what happens when a high yield bonds on a balance sheet, uh, and how much you should have in proportionality. And I think when we look at regulation, this really goes to the heart of your, your organization with the uh, Federal Home uh, Finance uh, Agency, they recognize while the Federal Home Loan Bank is an SEC registrant, it does an exam of each FHLB every year. An exam and a regulatory review is different than just saying the transparency of documents for disclosure. And that goes back again to the nexus of the strength and health of the, of the membership. So if you thread through that it's primarily housing related, membership related, it seems like it's transparent comportability comparable to the peers that are already within the system. I, I think you're rhyming to where we're, where you can add to the inclusion, and you're welcome on our boat. Thanks. I still have the scars from SEC registration, so I just going to Lori, are, are, are the current tests sufficient for, for mission or, or not? What, and what would you suggest? I mean, I, I sort of agree with, um, you know, sort of it makes sense to provide liquidity to those that make or hold mortgages. I wanted to actually respond to some of the regulation, transparency, capitalization statements that have been made. The home loan banks have often pointed to the fact that they have never lost money on an advance in almost 100 years. I look at that and say, they're not taking enough risk. Um, there is, you know, obviously you want institutions that have transparent financials that you can evaluate. You want them to be well capitalized, but that doesn't mean all institutions have to be capitalized equally. And the home loan banks have a number of other tools under their control. So in addition to admitting um, members, you can, the home loan banks also have the right to set haircuts on the assets that they use as collateral, as well as setting the rates on, the, on their advances. And they could differentiate by types of members. So I just wanted to react a little bit to the capitalization, transparency, and um, regulation statements by saying, yes, you definitely want transparency. You want them to be well capitalized, but that doesn't mean every Everyone has to be equally capitalized because there are other ways to differentiate. Thanks. Uh, uh, so you must have touched a nerve. Um, Anand and then Joan. So I, I agree with the, uh, the make and the hold. Um, as an example, uh, we, 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 we get our advances from all of the real estate loans that we hold, that we, we pledge to the FHLB. So the, the nuance that I want to add uh, to what has been already said uh, I agree that for, for the makers or the holders, the standardization of uh, oversight, the transparency of reported numbers, capitalization, all that is important. Maybe what else I would to add to it, and maybe you know, some of this is measured through all the metrics we me mentioned so far, is the stated intent or the objective of that institution. And what I mean by that is if there are certain institutions that are certainly well capitalized now and 
you know, showing all their you know, financials and whatnot, but they are speculative in nature. Um, you know, a lot of the, the speculation and the greed and, and the exuberance, irrational, all that we saw wasn't created or exacerbated by the, by the books regulated in entities. It, you know, the speculative side of it will drive a lot of that, you know, activity. So maybe there is an angle to say there should be, you know, for, for whoever is willing or intending to become a member, there is this stated objective returns. So to sort of limit it to non-speculative or non-highly risk-taking kind of uh, entities. Um, yeah, I'm just really responding to the non, non as a non-regulated <laughs> entity that is a member. Um, so I, most CDFIs are not regulated. We do have a subsidiary that houses our um, U.S. Uh, small business guaranteed um, loans, which are all commercial loans, not not mortgage. And um, of course, our our credit union is regulated. But when we became a member, the entity that became a member was not regulated. So, but we do have to still meet um, the tests, and we still had to prepare and present the information uh, that way. And I think um, most large CDFIs that have been around for 30 years are doing just what you said, um, presenting financial information on a consistent basis. And, and I just want to say that I think there are ways in which to assess an entity that's not regulated but treats its, its assets and treats its management um, in a way that you, know, you could be looked at by regulators. <coughs> Policy-wise, we can write paper that um, doesn't conform to everything that, that um, consumer policy has, but we follow fair lending and we follow um, that arrangement because of who we work with. Jim, before we move on, if you're real quick, you am going to let you move back in. Oh, I thought you wanted to move on. Oh, yeah, thank you. Say something. Uh, yeah, so I, two things. One, if any way my comments were misconstrued, CDFI should absolutely <laughs> continue to remain as members. That was uh, not my intent. In the boat. Uh, but the main point I wanted to say is on the, I thought it was a provocative thing in our pre-read about never having a loss. And that, does that indicate uh, proper risk taking? Uh, as pr a wholesaler provider of liquidity, never having a loss is, is a very good thing. Uh, and I would also point to the securities lending market, which functions basically as a, a two-party or tri-party repo. And in that, you pledge marketable securities with a haircut uh, as a loan, and there's not been a loss in securities lending. People that participated in securities lending with Lehman Brothers as a counterparty did not have a loss. The reason that's important is if there is the chance of a loss, you radically change the pricing of that asset, albeit remote, but it changes the criteria. The fundamental problem of the great financial crisis was a AAA rated security in that instance did not have anything close to the default rate of a AAA rated security. So I, I appreciate the idea of this, but being a whole uh, federally regulated system, providing wholesale funding to other regulated counterparties is not really the time that I'm looking at what should be in my loss ratio, like looking at credit card receivables. So. I think it's interesting, but I, I'm, I'm just really not that motivated on the loss argument to take uh, more risk and potentially what are the consequences because the members actually have capital at risk in this. I mean, there's, as a, our, our company alone has close to $200 million of capital at risk, so uh, we're not looking to see if we can take a, a loss on that investment. So. I appreciate that. You nuance it around the edges. Part of that's just priced in the advance. Unsurprising, we may be running long, but Julie, go ahead. Um, so I, it was the same um, comment about the loss that um, that actually had me chuckling. I started my career working um, for the FDIC during the banking crisis in New England, um, and I would almost say the Federal Home Loan Bank um, benefited from its policies because I knew of uh, quite men, many of um, bank presidents that actually drove their notes into Boston. Um, and those banks are no longer here. So it's not that they didn't lose members. They just didn't lose the borrowing capacity because they marshaled the assets first. And how smart is that? 
let me just mention that if you only make loans to, let's just say at the extreme, you only make loans to borrowers who are never going to default, you're right, you will have no losses, but you'll also make about three loans. There is an inevitable trade-off. Chris, can I have one other thing? Please. This is great because, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna latch on to Jim's analogy. Some of us are in a boat and some of us are not. And I sit here really on the outside almost like a joker, just kind of laughing and thinking about things from an intellectual perspective. So I really, I'm gonna express an opinion, you're not doing enough. That's my opinion. I think you should think again, if you've ever read Jim Grant's book. So as an organization, I think you should think again and understand that the original rules were created decades ago. And you should consider where we are in history. We are at a monumental moment in the housing finance system. The government entities that all of you sit on top of, which have held a huge amount of these assets, there is a huge stock effect that everyone has benefited from. They don't want to hold them, and I don't believe they have to hold them. But we have a huge advantage as a, com as a country. <laughs> we can borrow at unbelievable rates as our dollar is proving. This is a global issue. The capital by which our homeowners have is not just from American savers. So I believe you should think again. I don't think you're doing enough, but in the boat versus outside of the boat. We were in the boat, so make sure everyone understands. We were in the boat at one point, and everyone came out and said, okay, fine. We'll continue to go along. In March of 2020, we were borrowing money from the Cincy Bank. We took our money back because we didn't trust you, the FHLB. We took all our money back from any, bar any lender that we didn't trust. So we do extensive risk management. So we're a public company. So some of us are in the boat and some of us are not. And that's kind of a wrestling match here that we got. So let's establish that. And this is a good, good debate for that reason. But I will say, I don't think you're doing enough. And I think you should think again. But we got to think about what does that look like. The safety and soundness is very important. Um, understand the real problem of the great financial crash. Was the state, what were state regulators when all these subprime loans were being made? So it's not. It, it, I think we have to think a little broader about where we are in history, though, and can we make this work? I love Lori's example of, uh, you know, you can really always get no, no losses, but there is something more we can do, but we do have to put our heads together to try to figure out exactly what that is. Yeah, that's, this is a recurring theme that we've heard from a lot of commenters, so yeah, I'm sure you're, you're not particularly concerned about being on your own, uh, but uh, uh, it is something we've heard a lot of uh, from a lot of commentators, and as well as the, the counterpoint. Um, and Jim, I, another analogy that's going to get overused, I think, but and I'll try not to do it myself, but uh, it, does, it does capture it. Before we leave the test issue, though, I did want to say, I mean, uh, one of the things that comes up, uh, different entities have uh, under the current statute, uh, it applies, it doesn't apply. Uh, the the uh, how do you all react to the commentators who say this test should be a recurring test and an ongoing test, um, whether if it's assets um, uh, or, or whatever? You know, there are certain uh, cases where, under the current statute, where you just have to meet it at the application time, and after that, it doesn't really matter. Now, that doesn't apply to all entities. But um, a lot of people have said, well, this should be an ongoing test. And I think it, before my time, I think the agency did propose that and ended up not, not going that way. But how do you all feel about that? I'll go. You want? Okay. Jim? Um, I think it should be a initial membership test, and then it sh then that that that's that should be when it when it should uh, occur. Uh, before I get a little deeper in that, I just want to say, going back to our prior comment, one thing that's important about the federal home and bank system, um, we were describing that making no losses because you choose very highly rated counterparties. We treat all um, members equally. It's the over collateralization that provides the safety net. So you do not need to be JP Morgan to get the same terms as a uh, 50 million asset financial entity. So uh, it, that, that's not where the, the selection process is occurring. It's in the structure. But on the membership test, I think this is important. It goes to what we've been talking about, about there is variability, and it goes to what Byron's talking about, of when people that choose to hold long-dated assets choose to be long in the market. And you will have volatility for those that are able to hold long-dated assets, specifically on their relative appetite to hold it on the balance sheet. And remember what Byron said. It's a 30-year asset 
with a perpetual put option by the, the, the uh, borrower to take the loan away. So in a declining interest rate environment, they will choose to refinance. The collateral assets can substantially shrink, exactly what they're designed for to help that retail customer. And you can temporarily have a shift in that asset mix of the exact assets that we're putting on and a 30-year promise that go away. And the volatility of that and when you can replace those of that significance takes time. And the time to look at that and the need is not the time then, oh, okay, great, now you have to reestablish membership at the exact point of what could be the liquidity event. So I understand the importance of it as a toll gate. I think it works well as a toll gate, but at that point, then it's more of a function of you have access by being a member with your membership stock. If you have the sufficient collateral as it's defined, then that's your, that continues your functionality. So after you had joined, I think that would be sufficient. Julie, go ahead. So I think I would agree with that. If once you're a member, you're a member. Um, as far as the organization, um, then it's governed by collateral, and I think this is probably the time to talk about the unrealized loss. Like um, I think now is the time to talk about the unrealized loss on an investment portfolio. When you have periods of volatility, um, hampering access to capital during a period of time that, but for the interest rate and you're holding an asset to maturity, um, to actually impair borrowing capacity um, is, um, it's not, it doesn't help for the stability of the system. And I hear that, and obviously I understand we'll, we'll be talking about collateral in a little bit, um, and you know, obviously that does, uh, it can have a big impact after the fact, uh, and you can get some of the, the places there, but just to uh, play devil's advocate, you know, by, as Byron pointed out, not, not everybody's a, a wonderful, uh, well-intentioned person or, or maybe not focused on the mission as much as we might, we might like. Um, and, you know, certainly you can imagine situations where somebody might just acquire for the purposes, as a former FHFA director used to say, you know, everybody wants cheap funding. Um, but, uh, you know, just for the purposes of getting in, um, uh, purchase a, a portfolio of assets and then promptly sell it once the, the application goes through. Now they have access, they're in the boat, uh, uh, and the question is, it does, does, does that not sort of make, a, just to be devil's advocate, does that not make a sort of a mockery of the, the test, if, if that's the case? Um, and, you know, uh, so, uh, go ahead, Jim. Well, there, there's a couple of things. One, if you do become a member uh, and you have your membership stock, there are, in the Federal Home Loan Bank system of Cincinnati, I'm sure with others, there are members that don't actively use the system. So there is the process of being in. I think one thing that's important is a lot of members, and insurance members in particular, this is a very important contingent uh, utilization. We really use this very much in organizing around a backstop, so the contingent. Second, as a member, most of the federal home banks are organized that that's, that is not particularly liquid. So you can have your membership stock, but if you don't have the collateral, it, it can be stuck in the system for a number of years before you can even get your membership stock back out. So the idea about being in or out, I, th I do find it's kind of paradoxical in our discussion because the idea is, and I appreciate where Byron's going, we need to do more and we're trying to figure out inclusion at the exact moment that we're then applying a test about how to, how to get out because you temporarily have a little bit of a reduction in collateral assets. Now the idea about, and it's important to be a gatekeeper, be a policeman, get out bad actors, I think that's important. So if you said maybe uh, you know, there's a mechanism for recognizing that or an, an, a non-used entity, uh, but in, in general that contingent uh, usage is, is uh, for a lot of people, the benchmark even before actually the usage. Does anyone else wanna stick their neck out on this one? Pat, you, you keep turning I'm, that I'm one dying, way and that I'm goes dying, back the other I know, way. I know, it's hard, it's hard. Um, so on the topic specifically of whether the test should be ongoing, um, I don't think we feel terribly strongly about it, though we would think that it would make sense that the test be ongoing. This is to have access to the housing finance system, and if you're not a participant in the housing finance system, why do you continue to have access? Right? It doesn't, um, that, that seems, um, but I, I, and I'm gonna get myself in trouble now, it, it, because I, I, wanna, I, I wanna put this one out there, is 
The reason the federal home loan bank system did not take losses on advances is not because the system only financed high quality assets. It is not because the system only financed high quality counterparties. So uh, let me go through. The federal home loan bank system in the late aughts was one of the largest providers of funding for pay option arms through players like Golden West, uh, Countrywide Bank. The failure of those institutions was imminent, right? And it, and it posed risk to the system, right? There was not, I don't think anyone in the room would argue that those are high quality loans, right? But that was financed by the system, so that's not why it didn't fail. And it's also hard to say that they only financed high quality credit institutions. You know, every year banks fail. Banks have failed in great level, uh, levels along the way. The reasons why the federal home loan bank system has not taken losses on that, I would suggest, is because the FDIC has a super lien on the assets of a bank. And when a bank fails, that's a federal home loan bank member, what happens is the FDIC generally steps in and pays off the federal home loan bank. It's not because the institution was good. It's not because the loans was good. It was because there's another government institution that provides a guarantee. So at the end of the day, massive losses were taken. Those were losses were taken within the FDIC. And it, I challenged somebody to challenge my facts. I will pause momentarily to see if anyone wants to um, I just want to support what uh, Pat said. That's absolutely right. Um, and if you're only going to let institutions in the system who have that super lean status, and I realize um, CDFIs do not, but if you're going to let primarily institutions in the system that have that super lean status, you're not going to do a very good job serving the market. Thank you. And with that as a segue, let's uh, well let's turn. And we've heard uh, here today and in the written comments. Obviously, you know the the market's changed. So let's so now let's talk about members and who's in the boat, who's out of the boat, um, who's who do you want to throw overboard, um, or do you want to just keep the crew you got? So uh, I don't know. I, I said I wasn't going to overuse the analogy, but there you go. Um, so. Uh, if you think that it's the right the right mix, just if you could explain a little bit more about why you feel that way, it would be helpful. But um, I'll, anyone, anyone, floor's open, or I can call on somebody. But I know you all were opinionated in your written comments, so let's go. Okay, Lori, you want to start? Okay, I'll start. Um, so, I mean, the original purpose of the home loan the original purpose of the home loan bank system is to provide reliable liquidity to support housing finance and community development. Um, and right now, this the um, by as a, the membership uh, in the home loan bank system, um, as determined by Congress, is restricted to banks, insurance companies, and CDFIs. Um, however, um, and the overwhelming majority of the advances is, of course, to banks. Um, but I think it's really. But I I'm just want to say, yeah. credit unions and savings and loans. Cre also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would actually, I'm going to actually speak to non to non banks, independent mortgage bankers. They're certainly critical to the mission of supporting housing finance, and a source of liquidity that would remain in place during periods of stress would be very, very important. So first, I want to make the point that non banks are absolutely critical to the housing finance system, and I'm a more I'm a geek, so I'm going to use some numbers. In, um, in October of 2022, non-bank originators or independent mortgage bankers originated 92% of all Ginnie Mae loans, 71% of all Fannie Mae loans, and 65% of all Freddie Mac loans as measured by dollar volume. This is up from 30 to 40% of each of these three categories in 2013. That is, banks have de-emphasized mortgage lending, particularly government lending. And government lending is where the riskiest loans are concentrated. That is, the non-banks do a better job of serving lower-income borrowers and borrowers, of, uh, and borrowers of color than the banks do. A couple of numbers will make this more clear. Um, the median FICO score in October 
for agency mortgages was 731. That's 754 for GSE loans and 674 for Ginnie Mae loans. Within the Ginnie Mae universe, for non-banks, the um, average FICO score was 672. It was 697 for banks. In terms of LTVs, Ginny Mae loans tend to have a higher LTVs. The median is 96 and a half versus 80 for the GSE loans. For debt to income ratios, 39 for um, GSE loans versus about 44 for um, Ginnie Mae loans. And again, bank, non-banks have a wider credit box in Ginnie Mae space than the banks do. When you look at the, at the minority share of loans, um, FHA and VA do far more than the GSEs do. GSE HUMDA data for 2021 shows the GSE, that of GSE loans made, 72% were to white borrowers, 5.3% were to black borrowers, and 12.4% were to Hispanic borrowers. For FHA loans, 50.7% were to white borrowers, 18.8% to black borrowers, and 27.5% to Hispanic borrowers. So the credit box is much, much wider. Um, so let's sort of, so basically, non again, non-banks do serve, nine, are 92% of the Ginnie Mae market. And non-bank servicing has also increased dramatically. In the Ginnie Mae market, it's increased from about 28% in 2013 to about 80% in 2022. Now, it's important to realize that non-banks are very vulnerable to liquidity shocks because they don't have a source of stable short-term funding for their originations or their servicing advances. Warehouse lines of credit are provided by banks, and they can be canceled during times of stress. And non-banks would likely be unable to replace that funding. Again, these are solvent institutions with liquidity issues. Servicing on government-insured loans, particularly FHA and VA loans, can become a real burden during times of stress, and non-banks are far more exposed to this risk than banks are. If delinquencies were to rise dramatically and a few large or multiple small non-bank servicers were to fail, Ginnie Mae would, ha would have to transfer a good deal of servicing quickly. Um, in addition, the risk would be transmitted through contagion. The failure of one player could cause counterparties to question the viability of others as the market struggles to absorb the mortgage servicing rights. The public purpose being provided by allowing non-banks as members of the home loan bank system would be to provide additional stability to the housing finance system. If you had the failure of a few large banks or multiple small ones accompanied by a fall in um, MSR values, uh, um, causing a liquidity crunch. Mortgage credit, particularly credit to the riskier borrowers, that is, FHA borrowers, would evaporate overnight. This would depress home prices in low-income and minority communities that rely heavily on FHA funding, which would further increase defaults, creating um, the same type of negative feedback loop we saw in 2008. It would also create servicing chaos for many borrowers that would experience servicing transfers from failed institutions. So giving non-banks home loan bank membership would ease their vulnerability to liquidity shocks, which is critical to the home loan bank's mission of providing liquidity to the housing finance system. I really believe this has to be accompanied by meaningful prudential regulation in this industry. Um, I don't think it would affect the safety and soundness of the home loan bank system because, again, as I mentioned earlier, the home loan banks could adjust haircuts and pricing to compensate for the additional risk. But certainly, when you have non-banks serving 92% of the most vulnerable borrowers, it screams for their membership in this system. Thanks. There's a lot in there and a lot to go with, a lot for folks to respond to. Um, before accepting the, the, the positive statement that, that non-banks represent a, a s substantial part of the market, I, I don't think anybody argues against that. I mean, numbers are, as, as you said, <laughs> we're not entitled to our own facts. Um, I guess that the, as a normative matter, is that a good state of the world from for the housing market? I understand the liquidity aspect of providing uh, we, given that that's the current state providing liquidity to them to avoid uh, liquidity squeezes that could 
spread contagion would, would increase stability. But overall, are, is that a good state of the world, or are we encouraging, you know, is, is there a root, uh, are we treating the symptom rather than, than a cause that's driven, I mean, you use the phrase banks have de-emphasized. I just wanted to press a little bit on that. Uh, mortgage lending, is that something that happened exogenously? Are there reasons for that? Um, and what's your, your view on that? I don't mean to. Um, yeah, so I mean, um, banks basically um, have de-emphasized this lending because they fear the reputational risk. Um, they paid huge fines in terms of um, because of the False Claims Act, and um, you know, as, during the, uh, as a result of actions during the um, Great Financial Crisis, and they've pulled back from the market. Um, FHA has gone to uh, has gone to great contortions to try to get banks back in this market. They've made a lot of changes, but banks aren't coming back into this market because they're very, very they're very concerned about the reputational risk aspects of um, servicing of servicing riskier borrowers. And um, and in fact, um, you know, it's much more expensive to do that servicing. Um, the mechanisms for um, buying delinquent loans out of pools are very different for GSE loans rather than FHA loans. When um, the GSEs buy delinquent loans out of the GSEs themselves buy delinquent loans out of the pool when the loans are four months delinquent, and they and essentially um, the mortgages sit on the balance sheets of Fannie and Freddie, and the servicers are essentially pay or essentially reimbursed for serv for their servicing expenses. By contrast, when a government mortgage defaults, the servicer not only loses the servicing income, but they're responsible for advancing the monthly principal and interest payments to the investors using their own funds, as well as incurring the costs of servicing the loan until the default is resolved by the sale or some other mechanism, which puts a lot of pressure on servicers of government loans. Um, banks are, um, aren't happy about taking that risk. Um, and in many cases, they don't do it very well. I mean, I think the banks have pulled back from this sector totally and completely. They don't want, again, they don't want the reputational risk. And I think we have to recognize the reality of who our borrowers are and how we serve them. Fair enough. Julie, I look to you as a banker. I mean, do you, do you don't you want to make money? So I, I would disagree with the argument that banks have actually walked away for, um, for concerns about reputation. Um, the technology in the space and the investment in the space um, is significant. Um, there are constantly changing regulations, and we do our, um, our best to um, be prepared and, and make those changes and make the adjustments. Um, um, community banks use their balance sheet to, to lend to their community, and um, a lot happens outside that space now. Um, we're not happy that um, we are not originating over 50% of the residential mortgages um, in our marketplace. Um, so I, I would uh, disagree with that. Um, as far as FHA is concerned, I'm not sure what the reason is for um, banks not to be in that space as much, whether it's the audit requirements that were put in place um, a few years ago. I do know that there are some banks that have um, that saw that as a challenge based on the amount of volume that they were seeing um, as compared to the costs that, that were put in place on that on that front. Thanks. Jim and then Byron and Pat. Uh, so I think what's important is when we set this up and we talk about the originations by non-banks, they're not putting capital in. It goes back to where, what Byron was talking about. What's the source of capital? Uh, that's like saying that the car dealer builds cars. They don't. I mean, the cars are there. They sell them. But without Ford or somebody building the car, it's not there. The reason that the Ginnie Mae, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae thing works is it works on a volume basis to do the, all those loans and the technology you can't understate. But just look at the general plumbing. To do all those loans at that level of volume, the primary acceptor is Ginnie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Fannie Mae. And then they're bought by other investors in the agency RMBS market. The originator automatically looks at it and disaggregates from the equation, going exactly to your points. They don't want to put the energy into the servicing. Fannie and Freddie don't want to put the energy into the servicing. We're splitting up the actual 30-year mortgage, holding it in one area. So to do it at scale and to do it at volume, we've chosen to use these government entities to use the guarantees to do that, to repackage and hypothecate them into a later market. So the origination stats are a function of 
that's great on the origination, but they don't actually hold them in large form. It's the other entities that are doing it, and that's why we're disaggregating servicing, origination, and capital. Second, because I work on this in the fintech space where we're looking to acquire firms, you cannot underestimate the importance that technology plays. The ease of use that Rocket Mortgage and others have had in this recent housing boom to be able to look and have an approved mortgage on an app, on a phone, before you go, the convenience of doing that to be able to negotiate your home in a reasonable credit score works well. And I think part of the reason these numbers are so large, too, it depends what community you're in. I mean, you can get a federally preferred loan that can be $800,000 in assets. I mean, that's, you know, depending on how you want to work the numbers, they're doing a massive amount of what would be considered middle class housing in California, which would be very high class housing in Cincinnati. So, yes, I, the facts are absolutely correct that non-banks are doing a lot of origination, but let's not separate ourselves or divorce ourselves from the equation of the source of the capital and why the originators are or are not choosing to do servicing and why the uh, agencies are choosing to or to not do servicing. And then lastly, because of the way the agencies step in, banks look at it as a pricing matter. They, you know, they look for, for money, more money, the relative return that they can get in the other form of paper to keep on balance sheet or not, or choose to package and sell off, it's a financing equation. They're, the markets are efficient and the desire to make return is there. I mean, on the margin, yes, uh, but that's not the primary reason that, that the uh, market has continued to funnel and design a pipeline that works this way. You can't understate what Byron has said. We're the only country in the world that has a 30-year fixed mortgage. The entire treasury market for 28 years to 30 year uh, maturity is 2%. People do not tend to hold. And a treasury doesn't have the call feature. You have the call feature on top of it. You have to have someone who wants to have those assets. So looking at the origination equation without looking at the capital equation is just, I appreciate the origination number, but if you, if, if you don't have the source of funds, it doesn't matter. Byron, you were invoked. And, well, the, the, well, I go through the hierarchy of, of understanding. Again, I'm going to always start. Just understand I'm going to start from our housing finance system, how great it is. Um, the and, and now I will speak, look overboard. I'm outside the boat. <laughs> I'm going to speak from outside the boat. At Dynex, all we do are mortgage assets. Uh, 34 years, literally, that's all we do. Literally, in the residential sector, in the other related, but still multifamily, this is all we do. So um, so I have a hard time understanding why we don't st stay, but I'm open to hear why, why you, when you said eligibility requirements and then should there be other members? Yes, I'm outside of the boat. I believe you should be financing more of us that are outside of the boat. Um, we are regulated public as a public entity. I would love to teach some risk management thought processes for you to, or what, how do you judge? Because that becomes a challenge. Like, well, why do I judge that entity versus this entity? And it comes down to how, how do you look at a, 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 if you brought up FTX or numerous other people say, well, should I lend to that person or not? Uh, we didn't have a problem at, at Dynex in the subprime crisis. And um, I stopped making subprime loans or, or in 2003. So, we're a private entity, but when Freddie Mac came along with the multifamily program, we were one of the first buyers of their triple B bonds and their IOs. So there is a lot of activity that is happening outside of the boat. I would urge you to figure out how do you finance and bring liquidity to all of this activity that's happening outside of the boat. There's some way to get to some huge chunk of this activity. There's a lot of it, it's well-meaning, it's 100% focused on housing or related assets. Again, you could look at Dynex and see for, for 34 years, this is all, uh, all we've ever done. And other, other mortgage REITs are, are the same. But I also know that most people, if I went through and said, hey, do you know what a mortgage REIT is? Most won't understand. Most also won't understand that only a certain percentage of these housing assets in the US are actually held by, with cash. Almost all of it is held with some type of leverage or debt or financing. You're either financing it with 
deposits, <laughs> insurance policies, or at Dynex, we have short-term financings, which we are experts in terms of managing. So there's a different hierarchy of players, but we're not going, the Federal Reserve is not going to reduce their balance sheet of mortgage assets unless they're financed by someone with some type of leverage or debt. And you have the ability to influence that in the country, and I would urge you to think again about it. Pat. Yeah, I, I want to take the chance to emphasize or extend on a point that, that Lori made. Um, and because and, I think it, it really plays into this and it, it's worth repeating. I'm gonna, the summary was FHA, oh, what's that? I'm sorry. FHA, VA, and U.S. Ginny May, which is 92% done outside the banking industry, consists of FHA insured, VA insured, and USDA insured loans. So to be clear that every loan that goes into a Ginny has a government guarantee behind it. And, and this system, right, and the, the role of the federal home loan banking system is into providing liquidity to the housing finance system. And that system's evolved, right? And that evolution has really accelerated, not just over the last 15 months, but even over the last, uh, 15 years, but even over the last 10 years. So these loans that are guaranteed by federal agencies, it's not credit risk to the system. The challenges that that system faces today are ones of liquidity. And there's not a greater need that the federal home loan banking system can serve by providing liquidity into that process today because the sources of liquidity, the banking system, have, are no longer, for whatever reason, actively involved in that segment of the housing system. And that is the segment of the housing system that provides an, an extraordinarily large percentage or a disproportionately large percentage of loans to low to moderate income borrowers in low to moderate income communities in communities of color and to borrowers of color. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Anand, I'm going to drag you in here. I hope it's not against your will. But uh, in your written comments, you, you did have a perspective that said, uh, uh, particularly on the, the non-bank uh, potential membership, you said they have a, a government support already. It's uh, fading frame. I was hoping you might elaborate on that. Yeah. So, you know, as I, as I was listening to Lori's statistics and, you know, similar to Jim's position and, and the question you were asking, Chris, about is that a – is the outcome driven by the, the things you mentioned that, you know, the, the banks and credit unions, you know, like, like we said, we're here to make loans, uh, real estate loans. So we'd be happy to make more of them. Um, so it's not like we're like over half of our, over five and a half billion, and they're all uh, mortgage real estate loans. So I feel like the, the, intent that the non-banks have shown so far, I mean, maybe uh, some of the parallel that I can draw from, from the, you know, you mentioned um, some of the failed banks, you know, countrywide and, and such, like the, the level of involvement that, uh, I guess the, the size that has steadily increased of non-bank origin is just on my way here on the radio, I was hearing, you know, Lori mentioned as a percentage of agency uh, paper, but as a as a percentage of overall paper, um, the, the somebody from um, from Bloomberg said about uh, half of the originations are non banks. So, I don't know if that is because we don't you know banks and credit unions don't want to lend. It is because the non banks are taking it away from the banks through various different. Uh, means so we are uh, you know whether I think you yourself mentioned the the fair disclosure or uh, you know there there are claims that we you know we monitor websites that are the front end of originating some of these uh, loans so some of the bigger ones like Rocket and all they have a singular website that then has a process of calling and uh, you know closing and all that but there are many others that we've seen in our day-to-day -day business that we monitor that are, to, to use loosely, shady front ends. And, and then they are going into a pipeline. Um, we can't necessarily compete as a regulated entity with, with pipelines like that. So 
I'm not so sure that, you know, Chris used to say, the causality and the, the outcomes, I don't, I don't agree with the way that you portrayed it. I, I think it's different. So let me actually give you the numbers because I look at this every single day. Um, so probably a little bit, a little bit less than half of the originations are um, bank originations because about 30% of the market is bank portfolio originations. That is super high quality loans. And when you look at the um, profile of the loans made by banks and held on balance sheet, they are super high quality. They are um, disproportionately jumbo loans, um, in, in many cases over the Fannie and Freddie, even high conforming loan limit in many cases over the standard loan limit, but less than the conforming limit. So that's 30% of the, so that's 30% of your 100%. Um, in terms of the agency market, the numbers that I gave you were the right numbers. Um, and I think, you know, what's at issue is um, when you look at what banks are doing in government lending space, what they are doing, and this is a business choice, and they are, it's a business choice that they are more than, I mean, it's part of their business strategy, and that's fine. Everyone is entitled to their own business strategy. But what they're doing in many cases is taking the FHA or VA credit box and then putting additional overlays on top of that box. That is, FHA may permit a certain FICO score, but the, the banks want a higher FICO score in order to originate the loan. So, with, and, uh, so they're not keen on FHA lending to begin with, and then they put overlays on top of that credit box. Lori, so in your experience, is that coming from their pressure from their regulators? Um, it's coming from the reputational risk issues from the high cost of servicing delinquent loans and the reputational risk associated with servicing delinquent loans. Because as you expand the credit box, you invariably have a higher probability of default. And I mean, to the, um, you know, I think, you know, everyone is working on sort of ways to cushion the um, loss of one's home, and nobody wants to see borrowers lose their home. But the reason mortgage rates are where they are is because at the end of the day, this is secured lending, and you're going to have a certain amount of foreclosures. It's an inevitable part of the process, but there is a, but there is a perceived reputational risk associated with that. May I Do you follow up? Sure. So just a follow up on, as I'm thinking further about what this has done, you know, in a very short period of time, in, in my mind, we have, if I look at the percentage of non-bank originations and and then that all of that being put into the agencies, I feel like it's been a very short period of time that it has ballooned very quickly. I wonder what systematic risk we are putting on. Um, you know, you you mentioned yourself that there is is a potential liquidity or contingent liquidity issues if some shock event were to happen. Um, if, if those entities are servicing or if they have some role to play, whether this whole, uh, you know, the ballooning of uh, all, of all of the assets and the collateral that uh, agencies have put on, I don't know uh, if there's a, that we need to give some time before we open it even further, which is why my comment in the written that the, there has been sufficient or more than sufficient support provided by the agencies in enabling the growth. The models, the business models uh, of the non-banks that I've seen, at least the, the little that I understand about them, is that it is a, is a, it's a volume business. You know, they, they are not driven, the outcomes are great about the credit box and everything, but I don't believe they're driven by that intent. There is this, this notion of production. You know, they are being, they're incenting, they're, uh, you know, the investors that are there, they're trying to maximize the churn. You know, it's, so. Just to be clear, they're not setting the credit box. The credit box is being set by FHA, VA, the GSEs. All the, be all the non-banks are doing is originating to the standards set by that credit box. They are not themselves setting the credit box. Um, and I just want to emphasize that, again, that they're not taking market share from th that the banks have essentially abdicated that market, and they have basically left this sort of riskier lending 
um, with no one to um, originate the loans until the non-banks have, have come into the market, which is why you've had their huge expansion. All right, we are, uh, I'll let you, we're gonna take a break, but Julie, if you can be quick, we'll let you in, otherwise they'll all be mad at you. So, I, I, so I did like what Anand was saying, though, is that there is a source twice. Um, there is a source um, and um, federal support for flow lenders. Um, and a flow lender has a very short um, period of time where they actually have collateral to offer. Um, and um, the safety and soundness of the system that is actually built, which is the federal home loan bank system, yes, it's public purpose, but it is private capital and it's not subsidized by the federal government. So I, I think um, you know, maybe there's something else that could be built. Um, and I think that's where we're, we're talking here, is um, if there is some other model, um, then without destabilizing the existing model, um, I think that's something where we can think more about innovating around what do you do for flow lenders. All right, thanks. I mean, there's no good point to take a break because people are, you know, uh, we, there's a lot of interesting stuff here, a lot of issues. Um, but let's take a break now um, for uh, 20 minutes. I'm seeing 2-0. So that puts us back here at about, uh, what is it, 2, somebody do the math, 2.55. Two, two Thank you. She's the economist. <laughs> don't, no, don't ask a lawyer to do the math. All right, thanks, everyone. Um, as when we left, we were talking uh, about what types of entities should be eligible for membership. Is there anyone who had anything to add on that particular point that didn't get a chance uh, before? Um, anyone we hadn't heard from? Okay, uh, Pat? I just want to follow up on one yeah. of the things we started with down the path where Julia was saying, does there need to be a different structure for this? And, you know, this gets sort of outside of the realm of, I think, what can be done um, under the act today, maybe not, but right, should one federal home, right, and the federal home loan bank system is now divided geographically, mm -hmm. but if there was a federal home loan bank and every member of that federal home loan bank was a mortgage company, mm -hmm. it becomes a bit of a self-regulating entity that way. I don't know if that's better or it's worse, but it's one of the things that you think about, right? It's a cooperative mm -hmm. system, it's a cooperative risk system. Part of the, you know, uh, on the boat, off the boat comments relates to guys on the boat who don't understand the credit risk of this, right? They, they, it's, it's, we talk about the capital of the entity. Well, mortgage companies actually have significantly more capital to assets than banks do, right? We operate at ratios of kind of a four to one, maybe a five to one for a highly leveraged one. Those are, but you know, it's hard if you're inside those other institutions. And what we've had is a system that's evolved over 90 years. So, and the structure of that, right, the board members of the bank comes from the members. Well, that means the only people who are members on the board are people who work at banks or insurance companies. Uh, you can understand why they'd be hesitant to allow another entity onto the boat. So make a 12th boat or recreate a 12th boat, right, mm -hmm. and allow that 12th boat to consist In of. Armada. What's that? Armada. No, it just needs to be its own boat. <laughs> you already got 11. You had 12, now you got 11. You don't have to make it 12. Um, uh, but I would, I'd like to ask it so uh, in the other way around. What would these new members add to the system? Obviously, they would get a certain benefit from it. They might add some advances. But what would they bring to the system? Is that a question of me? Um, if Can I you, follow through? If you'd like to answer it, but then I'll go oh. to uh, Brian. Uh, um, um, yeah. uh, I'm happy to Byron. start. I'm happy to start, and I'll speak from the uh, perspective of, of a mortgage REIT or in representing a mortgage REIT council at NAE REIT. Um, we're going to bring a lot of housing activity. We literally are aligned with the mission of the Federal Home Loan Bank. Everything we do is 100 percent re related. We're regulated, so we're public entities in almost every mortgage REIT, all of them. We're all public entities, mm -hmm. so we are regulated to start. Um, we bring a lot of housing activity. Mm -hmm. a lot of long-term investors in the U.S. housing finance system. And I believe that's really important, is what's the focus of, uh, of the entity. And that, that's aligned with the, uh, uh, with the Federal Home Loan Bank uh, mission. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when as I listened to the, the conversation, it made me start to say, well, wow, how much really is the Federal Home Loan Bank system really involved in the housing finance, or is most of it away from you? And I, mean, I don't know the answer to that, but that was a question that popped in my mind as I listened mm -hmm. to the conversations that took place. So what are we bringing to the table? 
We're bringing a focus on the housing finance system, and more important, since we established the, the, the complexity of the products, mm -hmm. we, we bring expertise. Because our American housing finance system needs expertise for managing the risk of these assets over the long term. Remember, we're making a 30-year mortgage. It is prepayable. It is a complex instrument. So mm -hmm. we're bringing housing finance um, activity, 100%. We're bringing expertise to the table for risk managing those assets. Uh, and we're bringing a willingness to sit down and chat about, well, well what kind of rules can we come up with or, to make it work? <laughs> um, and are there any ways in which some of these entities would help push the envelope in terms of reaching more borrowers who are underserved? Or um, not just not just taking the loans that are already being made, but but in in either reaching out to them, uh, building more affordable housing. Yes. So um, I, when I joined Dynex in 2008, what was amazing, people were giving us back loans, and I was going out to look at the properties. They were literally innovators in the light tech space between 1988 and 1998. So there's a lot of innovation, and when I say innovation, it's just a willingness to attempt to lend to some others who might not be lent to through the, the normal banking system that has happened. And you could argue, well, well, did it go too far with some of those entities who might have been in the, the subprime space? Eh, maybe so. Um, but for uh, um, the general innovation of who all gets a loan, part of the housing finance system will come from the traditional banking system but a huge amount will also come from other financial institutions who are willing to take that risk and attempt to innovate to assure that there are more Americans that actually do have homes. That opportunity is always there. The entity that's going to take the risk will be those entities that are in our capitalist system that are willing to take that can or I innovate on the technology. To follow up on one of Joshua's points at the beginning, can I ask how? How would the innovation happen? Yeah. How how would they do? How might they do that? So when I when I listened to the conversations earlier, I heard one person say, "Well, those guys, they've got that technology that allow." Well, who invented? Them? Who would? Who had the incentive to go and create the technology to try to to produce loans in, in that manner? And so, look, I've got one bank account with one entity that is not one of the large traditional ones. The technology is phenomenal. I went and opened one with one of the larger, more traditional, well-known banks. The technology is horrible; it doesn't even compare. So that's where that's how. It, so we already talked about uh, the technology at Dynex specifically, um, the willingness to participate in new ideas sooner than some of the more regulated institu institutions might be willing to play. And we do have a track, a traceable track record that I could follow up and produce you some information to say, here, when we were doing these loans, others were not uh, doing them. Or when Freddie Mac started their the Freddie Mac K program, we were one of the first investors to buy their uh, uh, their securities off of that program. And another, and another instance, and it's nothing, it's not an either or. A lot of what we've been talking about, it has to be either or. And what I'm saying is I don't believe it has to be either or. There's a broad range of, of participants in our housing finance system that is serving a role. And so when I say, when I try to galvanize you to say, think again, I'm saying, think broader, ask that question, let's have a follow-up to say, let's really be more specific about how that can work, and let's take a look backwards in, in history and identify how. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I know you've been waiting. Oh, he raising great points. So just two things. I would say we want to remind ourselves from 32 forward, Federal Home Loan Bank has continued to evolve. So if the original two were savings and loans and insurance companies, later in the 90s, commercial banks were added, then credit unions, and now the CDFIs. So we have continued to expand. But I, in the interest of time at our break, I did want to say we kept using the phrase non-bank, and without being provocative, every organization has the opportunity at its outset to organize in the manner it wishes to conduct itself. And you, at that choice, Anybody could choose to be a bank or buy a bank. And it chose an organizational structure that wasn't a bank that provided deposits, access to the Federal Reserve, and all the accoutrements that flow with a bank. It was either for a host of other reasons, potentially banking wasn't chosen. 
One of the things that, uh, there are organizations that were formed as corporations that reorganized as REITs. For tax efficiency, there's a 90% takeout, takeout ratio, the treatment of double taxation. There's a lot of different reasons. People organize. When liquidity was needed in the great financial crisis, the Goldman Sachs, the Morgan Stanley's of the world saw the importance of liquidity and got into the banking business. And then from a FinTech perspective, they chose to expand it with um, Marcus to have a very large uh, consumer bank. So we see that uh, evolution occurring. When Rocket Mortgage spoke to our National Federal Home Loan Bank <laughs> Conference, the founder said, hey, we had two, I think it was two or 400 mortgage banking offices, and he said, no more. We decided, it was in a meeting, we're not gonna go tech in office, we're shutting down the office, we're gonna take the gamble and go all tech. So they went down an all tech model, but without it, in an all tech model, you don't have a deposit gathering system. You don't have your branch network, you're gonna have always function under more of a broker deposit manner. Where, 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 what is your source of funds? So you've chosen your path and your liquidity parameters and with your investor base, how you were designed to do your return. So in a mortgage REIT, the primary investor chooses to invest as a equity investor. And That's they're correct. gonna make their money in return as an equity investor. That was the capitalization structure that they set the structure up in order to make a return, pay a very great dividend, an awesome return. I am a REIT holder on my personal portfolio, <laughs> so I understand the, the role that it plays, but that was the design. Um, I'd like to just turn back for just a minute um, to the just the question of membership, and I don't know we've had a chance uh, for you to uh, weigh in on this, Joan. On, um, on, on, the, on what types of entities should be members, whether we should preserve largely the status quo or whether there should be some other types of members added. I probably have um, less experience with all the other players to really weigh in with different comments that have been made. But as far as the the CDFIs have been one of the more recent mm -hmm. types of members, and um, as a CDFI, um, do you find using the different uh, products of the system, I, I think CDFIs contribute back in some ways. How do you feel about other groups contributing back and what they might add? Oh, as far as what they add, I do think um, from a CDFI standpoint, um, many CDFIs are very uh, led on housing lending, and you know the access to the capital is the is the most tremendous. I think our capability of understanding how to work in markets where traditional financing has not worked well um, and has had more losses than not. I think um, the CDFIs can bring uh, a lot of expertise and understanding of how to work with that market. A huge part of that capacity is um, we aren't driven um, by a, most are, not all, but many are nonprofit, so we're not driven by a bottom line um, mm -hmm. profit, although we, we don't lose money. Uh, we can't lose money. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but we um, also, I think, understand that there are certain individual families that are not gonna fit into a traditional market, and we can really, I think, partner with other banks um, that cannot make it based on their, um, mm -hmm. sorry, risk profile, and, and we would be able to work with those. Borrowers uh, typically takes much more time. Um, we, we do some um, residential lending in one of our organizations, and we're typically working with the borrower for 18 months to two years <laughs> before they actually get the mortgage because we're basically bringing them forward. Many are immigrants, uh, not familiar with the U.S. banking system, and they're becoming um, familiar with it. So I think we bring that kind of expertise of how do you really penetrate um, mm -hmm. the markets that aren't getting access um, and, and bring them along into the, into the financial system. Because I think that's one of the things we have talked about as far as the mission in some other ways is how do you push the core business? Yes, there are the, the very beneficial affordable housing programs, but um, how, do, how do you push the, that business as well? And um, Lori, I, did, I know that you, were t you had um, had some thoughts earlier about the having some members that might be priced differently or treated, you know, have different experience um, right now, members that get in 
are generally subject to the same pricing because of the, the rules called 7J that fair equal treatment or fair treatment um, equitable, I think is the correct term um, of members. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, so um, you know, as Pat um, so correctly pointed out earlier, um, banks have this super lean. You know, home loan bank basically has this super lean status with respect to bank players, which minimizes their losses. Um, obviously, if you you know the entities that we're talking about admitting, you would not have that. And yes, insurance companies and CDFIs do not have that. Insurance companies have it to a greater degree than. CDFIs, but by and large, they don't have it. But they're also not a huge amount of home loan bank lending. Banks are, um, banks constitute the bulk of the home loan bank advances. So what, I, you know, and if I said to you, well, you know, if you never, if I said to you, you, you know, you could double your, you could triple your importance in this market if you had a 0.0001% default rate and, um, you know, and you tripled your role in the market, most people would say, well, gee, that's a really important trade-off because we're helping to prevent um, liquidity crises. So what I was thinking, so my, my point was that, hey, you can basically, you know, the conceptual possibility is charging either a higher rate or higher haircuts that is requiring more collateral from players who are um, a little bit more risky. I mean, basically, risk-based pricing is a tenant of the financial system, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be applied here. And if you could do differential haircuts to compensate for that or differential pricing, um, you know, if you had a very small probability of loss and you charged a little bit more, you would more than compensate for that loss, and it would not compromise any member stock or anything like that. So that, that's where I was. Um, that's where I was coming from. But would, but if you did that, would the, would the institutions still benefit from membership? Would they? Absolutely. Would that? Would Absolutely. those terms work? Absolutely. So, just to be really, in my point of view, membership is actually critical during periods of crisis. That's when it really comes into play. Normally, you know, there's a there's a market out there, and if you're Pricing is more expensive than the market most of the time, but you're there during periods of crisis. You have been a godsend to this market. Um, so, you know, so the answer is absolutely. I mean, you know, the way I see it is the purpose of expanding the base is to preserve the stability of the housing finance system, which makes, again, makes you critical during periods of crisis. And you see it when you look at when your advances have been made. And when people take out those advances, it's during periods of crisis. I guess I would just ask the those of you who are current members, I mean, how do you respond? I mean, 7J has been a, a bedrock principle in the, in the system for many years. Uh, how, how do you react to that? I mean, the, there's some Uh, Anand, you were you were uh, had your comment. yeah. So yeah. I, I was actually <clears throat> trying to respond to uh, to Jones' uh, comments about the and your question about the CDFIs and if there are similar entities that may be beneficial and they will benefit and eventually would serve the purpose of FHFA. Um, I, I personally believe that the uh, the addition of CDFIs was a good one. Um, as I see, you know, my, I made an earlier remark about the the dual mandate and when there is the the notion of community economic development as being a separate and, uh, you know, and sort of evolving uh, effort, because I, like I said, you know, the liquidity part of it is fairly well covered and well done. But that part, the second part, the CDFIs play a good and, and important role. The thing I mentioned was the, uh, the awareness and education. Mm -hmm. I think they, the, the, you know, most of them that I have seen, at least in our area, they have that um, as a proportion of their uh, giving or, or their effort. That's a big portion, which I think mm -hmm. should eventually help with the community economic development uh, through education and awareness. Um, the other benefit that I see entities like CDFIs bring, um, and we may probably talk about it later, is on the collateral side. Uh, the small businesses in a local area, um, if, again, for the second mandate of community economic development, small businesses make up a big uh, portion of the economic well-being and you know passing on of wealth and the, the points that were made earlier that the CDFIs are very actively bringing that collateral in as well. Okay. Julianne, did I see you had a uh, were ready to comment before? Okay. 
Um, uh, moving on, there was one issue that had come up um, before was what about the use of conduits? Um, in the absence of a statutory change regarding membership eligibility, um, I think someone had suggested members be allowed to enter as conduits um, to allow entities that are ineligible by statute. Um, should, that, should that be permitted and why or why not? Anyone want to? Okay. Well, I'm no? biased. I mean, oh. we had a, a, <laughs> a, an insurance company that allowed us into the system. Um, and I'm going to st still speak from the perspective of those who are in the boat um, to look out. And there's a lot of activity that's happening outside of the boat. And so if that's the only route, and I don't fully understand how hard it would be for you to expand, a membership, but if that is the most convenient or, 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 or the easiest way to allow more to come in who are actually involved in the housing finance system, and I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't think what you set up before was bad, but, it, but, but I understand there are others who might have used the conduit who may not have really been totally focused on housing, and I think that's not good. I think you really should hold the line on whether they're focused on housing or not. I would rather just have the, the membership allowed. It would make more sense uh, to me uh, mm -hmm. to do that. But again, the goal ultimately would be, are you furthering your mission by supporting housing? Lori made a great point that many don't understand. You're the most important moment is during the liquidity squeezes that will, that will happen periodically, that's the, the most important moment because most times you just get through through those periods and the housing system uh, continues. And, and right now, we're in a transitioning period. The Fed, the Fed has served a role, Freddie and Fannie served a role before, and we are in limbo as a housing finance system. Mm -hmm. So if that's the, the most expedient route, and you can regulate it, then I would, when again, I emphasize it, you can regulate it? I think that's the question, isn't it? If, if it can be, can it be appropriately regulated that entities would follow, would in fact be associated with housing and, and the types of housing that would further um, the, the reach of the system? Julie? So I think um, we're at a little bit of a feedback loop, right? Um, when you actually talk about um, a conduit and how you actually monitor the activities, because we did say we probably don't want to be audited on an annual basis to find out whether or not we meet the eligibility requirements that we um, achieved 25 years ago or 100 years ago, depending on, on the institution. And we certainly aren't going to raise our hand for a new regulator um, at our financial institution. I think we have enough. Um, but but um, and. Um, the concept of um, partnering with a financial institution, um, if you had a relationship and were pledging assets on behalf, um, but it does come back down to the safety of the system and whether or not there are assets behind it. When we, I alluded earlier to the concept of, you know, that there are um, non-bank lenders that um, are funding a flow, but eventually are offloading an asset. Um, and so there is a point in time where you actually need to know where you're getting paid back and from what. Um, You'd also, you'd also said in your earlier comments you had, you had raised a question about a non-financial institution um, uh, being, having access. And um, again, what, what authority, how, how could that be addressed? Um, if, if the agency, um, what could the agency do since the Bank Act neither really authorizes the exclusion of an an eligible entity, so if, if, if an entity that were acquired by someone else, um, um, that entity is eligible, but money can go back and forth, and I think the broader question could be, could be, could be, could um, be generate, could be taken to affiliate relationships in general. Um, how is there, what, what things should we be thinking about in terms of affiliate relationships and um, the parent entities and the affiliates? 
So when you first asked the question, I was thinking about it um, as it related to Byron. But in my remarks, one of the comments that I made is we're seeing so many other fintechs um, and other financial um, organizations that um, are, have become very, very large by banks. So um, what happens when all of a sudden Amazon is a um, borrower of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston and becomes the biggest customer? So, um, so we probably should be thinking um, as an organization about what happens when um, the owner of the financial institution now has access to the borrowing um, capacity of, um, of the subsidiary that they acquired and what, the, what are the implications, further implications um, for an unregulated, very large organization when they start moving money from um, subsidiary to subsidiary. Okay. Uh, Pat? Um, oh, and, um, then, and then Jim. After I'll go. No, Jim, you go. Please, please. please. No, no, no. You were there first. My apologies, <laughs> sir. Okay. Um, so I'll just say I'm I'm not supportive of indirect eligibility. I think mm -hmm. it's uh, it has challenges. I understand the motivation of what we're trying to get to, uh, but it, it clouds the the entity is indirect, and I'm trying to understand parent to host of how I under underwrite the member entity relative to the housing entity with the magnitude of the assets, how I understand the credit decision. Even if we went down the hold co discussion, which is viable about an Amazon, uh, Berkshire Hathaway through its insurance company could be a member, but it would join as an insurance company. It is a large organization with railroads in that, but you'd still underwrite it under the assets of the insurance entity directly. Um, as Western Southern, we operate with a lot of statutory entities and a lot of bank holding companies have multiple entities. We make each one of those join specifically as a member when they join. It is that membership and the activity resides within that, the balance sheet and those assets. That's the beauty of our statutory regulation. They protect our policyholders that we don't abnormally have one subsidiary earn all the income to the deficit of another subsidiary, and that other subsidiary bears the risk for those policyholders. So inextricably tying to that, uh, this parent to host of indirect eligibility, I think is, uh, goes back to understanding then the criteria of membership, of what you're actually doing your uh, credit underwriting of. The other thing that's important for us uh, representing the insurance industry, uh, we understand what we are as insurance companies and as, as original members. We have a direct relationship with our policyholders. We're set up to do business with them. We have a retail relationship with them. We sold them either a life insurance policy or an annuity. I'm speaking on behalf of life. I'm not speaking on behalf of property and casualty. We also do pension relationships, their retirement assets. That is where our premiums reside. And when we were talking leverage, we really don't have leverage when the cash flow is created. It's 30 years later, hopefully for people that they don't die, that we're waiting to make their death benefit. Um, captives are a different animal. That's not really participating in the insurance industry. A captive is a mechanism. When I was at Eastman Kodak, we would set up captives because we didn't want to bear all the fire insurance risk for our film uh, factory on balance sheet, and we could put it in our own entity, self-insure it, and sell other insurance off it. There's a mechanism of how much first dollar fire risk you wanted to bear on or off balance sheet is different than saying Eastman Kodak was an insurance company. There was no actual customer there. There was no, you, 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 you held it in that form. So one of the concerns from an insurance perspective is there's been discussions about insurance companies as members. And categorically, insurance companies should remain as members. I get concerned if this captive nature uh, of creating this in, uh, indirect eligibility in any way affects the definition of what has been members from the original intent of the statute uh, to remain. And the, the other part that I think it's hard is when you look at these member indirect eligible entities, the host entity that has membership versus the other entity that has the assets, they're widely disproportionate. You could have a 50 billion entity that's not the member that holds the collateral. That process of what that exactly means to the member en entity and the fungibility is a different way of looking at uh, understanding it and uh, credit rated. Uh, if you look at the vast majority of insurance companies, most of us are at least rated by one 
rating agency like AMBAS. Some of us that participate in the capital markets have multiple, but vast, a, a large percent have some um, uh, rating, and that's not the case in the captive space. Okay. Did you? Yeah, uh, let me. The I think there's a bit of a misnomer about an eligible entity, right? An insurance company is an eligible entity. Right, it's eligible under the Act. It's been eligible under the Act since 1932. The Act didn't clearly define what an insurance company was and left that regulation to the state. The only way that changed was the 16 rule, right? Which just narrowed out, as I understand it, basically captives. I think we're, you know, that's that, that's fine. But they're eligible entities. So, so the, the question of whether one can be a conduit for another or how that functions, right? I, I think Chase, finances loans that come through Chase Home Mortgage. Chase Home Mortgage would be an ineligible entity. Are we suggesting that Chase can't find finance mortgages from Chase Home Mortgage because Chase Home Mortgage is an ineligible entity? Chase Bank doesn't make that much in the way of mortgage. Chase Home Mortgage does. Wells Fargo Home Mortgage makes loans. Not so much Wells Fargo Bank, right? It's those things saying, I, I think we need to be intellectually honest about that and say, these vehicles exist. They have affiliates that are non-banks or, you know, and what we're talking about is here's a, an entity which is eligible, an insurance company that would have an affiliate that would not be an insurance company that could have access to the system. I have to ask, though, are you saying that the Chase Home Mortgage entity assets are going to be used for Chase Bank as the, the assets Chase Home for the advance? Because that's not what occurs. Well, they end up going from Chase Home Mortgage to Chase, right? But that's also a viable they're, alternative. They're acquired. What's that? They're, they're acquired. They're not pledged by the actual assets of but the But that act. pledge, neither the pledge nor the guarantee are prohibited under the Act. Right? Those are permissible under the Act today. It's only bank policy and regulatory approach that, that might impact that, as I understand it. There's a whole bunch. I'm probably talking out of turn because the room is full of people from federal loan banks who probably know mm -hmm. better, but I, I don't believe, right? Go ahead, Chris, you want to correct me? No, I was just thinking we're, we're going to 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I, I want to ask one more thing and then we'll, we'll turn to the uh, next, the other set. Um, just under the existing regulations, the standards by which the financial condition of membership applicants are assessed differ depending on the type of institution in question. Should there be a common set of, of safety and soundness eligibility criteria across all member types, and if so, sort of generally, what those what should those be, um, and if not, why should they differ? Any thoughts on that? I have a strong opinion. No, uh, they uh, should not be the same. And the reason is, uh, be, get closer to your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry about that. The reason is, you you write insurance policies or you take deposits. Mm -hmm. That is a different entity than Dynex Capital, which you pointed out correctly, where we have shareholders who will leave a deposit with one of you, they will take an insurance company with another one, and then they'll buy my sh shares. And in all situations, the saver is where the housing finance system starts. And we must take care of that person, but we're different. And I believe you should approach us differently. I believe that we should be regulated differently, but regulation nonetheless, so we're public entities, so we're regulated. So I do think you should start first. And a lot of the conversation's kind of either or. And I'm from the perspective, that it's not either or. It's like, no, you can expand the boat, but just approach it knowing that the entities are different from the perspective that an enormous amount of the housing finance system happens outside of your boat right now. And that's, that's and it happens in different types of entities. If I use, if you said a boat, if we have an ark, you got three animals on the ark. There's about a thousand of them standing on land. <laughs> I'm just being goofy in that sense. And I know it's a more formal environment. I shouldn't be that way, but just smiling, you know. <laughs> uh, Joan? I just want to make sure, if you could say it one more time, because I think my answer is what I want to say, but I don't want to go down the wrong. Uh, just, from, just in general, do you, um, should there be a common set of safety and soundness eligibility criteria, or how should they differ if if you don't think that. So I think there's probably very standard that everybody mm -hmm. has to follow um, mm -hmm. about being, you know, creating a an entity that um, 
uses other people's financial resources wisely, and that's safety and soundness, right? We, mm -hmm. we as a CDFI, um, may not get um, deposits from individuals, but we, we borrow money um, from m many, many dozens of banks, and their expectation is they're getting their money back, they're not losing it. And, and then we turn around and lend that money to individuals, businesses, communities, and we expect that money to come back and any losses we bear, um, we don't want the investors to have to, um, to take any loss from us. So, I mean, I think there's basic safety and soundness mm -hmm. and you can measure that on a common basis among many businesses, but then there's where is the difference and how do you look at it? Mm -hmm. Our balance sheet isn't gonna look like your balance sheet, <laughs> but there's gonna be similarities, right? And you can have, I don't know that it'd be common tests of ratios and that type of stuff, but I think there is a way to underwrite to a common set of standards, but understand there has to be differences. And financial institutions do that all the time, right? We don't underwrite um, a home mortgage the same way we underwrite a small business loan, um, but we have common sets of underwriting criteria. So I think a standard would eliminate more than it would benefit. Okay. I, I'll turn it to Chris, who has some uh, the last set of questions, I think. Thanks. Sure. I think one thing we need to think about also when we're talking about the next wave of members is if that next wave of members, and we compare sometimes to CDFI, we should get a sense of what do we anticipate the rev relative scale of their membership presents after membership. We're a little quieter on that. Uh, in the, the nature of where we're at, mortgage REITs are huge, and their, their collateral eligible assets could be in excess of $100 billion. So that type of adjustment to the system under what credit apparatus or capital structure we understand them needs to be understand. I don't anticipate that we would anticipate that under its current structure, a CDFI system nationally could generate a $100 billion increase into the system to understand the underlying credit that that would propose. So understanding the particularities of saying it has the consequence of membership, but then understanding after the fact for a federal home loan bank, when it's utilizing at its fullest capacity, what credit exposure it does present to the balance sheet of the bank has not been something we've tried to address. We've only just said that you get in. Right. Let me just react to that statement. Um, the purpose of the home loan bank system is to provide liquidity to the mortgage market, saying we don't want institutions that are major players in the mortgage market to benefit from membership because it would strain the system. It, I mean, yes, you have to look at the impact, but that's a non sequitur. That just does not make sense. I mean, you know, we're talking about institutions that when the act, when the home loan bank act was um, first um, passed were, didn't even exist. I mean, you know, insurance companies, when they were admitted to the system, were huge holders of mortgages. They have diminished in importance very, very substantially through Completely time. Disagree. Other players have gotten much more important. I mean, I think you want the players that are important to the system to guarantee the liquidity of the system. Yeah. Thank Thanks. So let me just, let me just, I did, I did warn Jim that this question was going to come up, and I'm glad you, you raised it, Laurie, because I was going to raise it. So, the world has changed, Jim. Uh, just what's, I'll give, let you make the case for insurance companies, again, uh, with, a, with a blank slate bank act. Um, yeah. You know, sure. if, if, if you if all had to argue why you're in the boat, go ahead. Yeah. And I just want to say my, my prior comment, I'm not saying every, all people should be a member. What we're saying is if they have mortgage assets and came in as a member, the proportional size that they could use the system could be large relative to collateral but we're saying that those members that would join, we don't have a consistent way of understanding the credit risk. So the fact that you can make a $100 billion loan, but you'd have a completely different capital and credit structure, at least needs to be considered in the same way that any counterparty looks at it. I'm saying everybody should compete, com participate in the system. You would just size 100 billion of exposure relative to understanding its credit. Uh, insurance companies. Um, so, as a member, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I love them, and I would, you know, when I look at the boat, I would say we sort of look at the members like the Willy Wonka tickets. We were in the original Willy Wonka tickets, so we uh, we sort of feel like we should be there. Everybody wants to be Willy, and nobody wants to be Farouk Assault, but 
but that's not enough. Uh, one of the things that gets missed is how much insurance companies participate in the housing market. Uh, goes exactly to what Byron says. We are the, other than pensions, the only entity that needs to hold 30-year assets. It's exactly what our business has been set up on from inception. It's based on life contingency and people living 30 or 40 years. And our balance sheets are set up if we never issued one more policy that we can meet the claims of every death claim for the next 30, 40 years. All those outflows are pre-funded under different risk scenarios. Our system today holds 6.6 .6 billion of capital in the federal home loan bank system that we hold at risk that all this activity works right. We don't earn a competitive return on that 6.6 .6 billion. We put all our assets on our balance sheet. We would probably rather hold REIT paper than own Federal Home Loan Bank at 6.6. 6. The dividend yield is not worth it for the R. This is the only membership that has a capital charge to hold our capital stock. So we're crucial to the system. If we weren't in, you're gonna try to expand affordable housing with one of your largest advanced users that generates a lot of income to create affordable housing, to create the income, and the capital that's the shock absorber to the system. The other thing that's unique about insurance companies that helps the system is because we're long dated assets, we're not traders. Our balances are held against long dated assets. So you look at our balances, they adjust a bit, but most insurance members are consistent borrowers. Our balances tend to be in the rough order of magnitude. They can go up 10 to 20, 10 ish percent as a group. A little bit of that uh, maturity of, of one's rolling off, but it provides a great glue to the system. We're uh, a definite balance to large commercial banks that need liquidity, savings loans at another. So we're a great mix in the asset mix. We're in the middle range. Now, where do we fit really in this housing cycle? We're huge in this housing cycle. Where it evolved is it is very difficult for a multi billion dollar insurance company to place tens of billions of assets in the housing market in large quantity. We're not set up in a distribution system with a branch network to purchase $200,000 mortgages on a one-off basis. Everything that Lori said about the setup of the system was designed over time for us to hold it in the RMBS market. It's much more simple and it goes exactly to our assets. There are times that we want long dated assets and that's why we like the longest date against our life portfolios. But in our annuity portfolios, we more like a five or 10 based assets. Banks aren't set up that way. They have more shorter term deposits. They should do exactly what they do. It's where we complement the system. But insurance companies are integral to this that we provide this. The other thing that's crucial to understand insurance companies is we provide life insurance and credit insurance for the underlying mortgage. If the person dies holding the mortgage, it prevents the bankruptcy on the mortgage because the proceeds of a life insurance company resupport the activity. We also, our life insurance and our health insurance and our retirement insurance all support. A lot of people's mortgages go beyond the years of their job years. So we're absolutely integral to the system. Now the nature of the life insurance business, we purchase everything on a relative value basis. And what people don't understand is the bond market is basically was built on the backs of the insurance companies for over 100 years. We are long dated assets. If you look, long dated bonds have always been bought, and that's the uniqueness buyer mentioned, but it's also in the corporate market. Long dated bonds occur in the, in the United States. Long dated assets occur in banking in Europe. They're not, they don't issue in the same manner. That's what we do. But we have to look at that as a relative value trade. There are times we hold corporate bonds. But we're active in that. We use our advances. We are all part of the public purpose. We are in a consumer business. We do everything for individuals. We're large employers, all our agents, all the employees. We, we provide the need exactly in the driving of our assets uh, to do this. Uh, we are supported uh, by ourselves and our guarantee funds. So we support our, our risk insurance by paying our own premiums. We, self, we come up with the proceeds when executive life went under in California last year, that was in 1991. Our company paid off its last <laughs> payment to, to cover that so that everybody was uh, made whole. Uh, does anyone, I'm sorry to cut you off, we are getting sort of late in the game, but okay. does anyone want to respond to Please? 
to Jim, I don't want to, you know. There's not enough long dated, there's not enough long dated liabilities to finance our housing finance system. That's what I'm saying. You got to get more entities because he's right. You, to understand the system, you got to separate it. How much can the insurance companies take? How much can the banks take? How much can another entity, how much can mortgage REITs take? How much will foreign banks take, foreign entities? It could be foreign central banks, foreign um, insurance companies can take. So you have to, but there's not. What has happened is there's far more debt has outstripped the financing whether it's our government blowing open their deficit and bringing treasuries, or whether it's mortgage assets. The, the population of, of our country has increased. There's not enough. So therefore, you're providing shorter term financing. And Mike, you're not providing 30, you're not gonna, I couldn't come to you and get a 30 year financing for my 30 year bond, can I? Locked, fixed, probably not. It's gonna be shorter term. And that's what's very important to understand. We're taking this for granted. The Federal Reserve, the, by the Federal Reserve Bank's balance sheet is long dated financing. And they're saying we want to move those assets into the private sector. Therefore, we need to have them financed. There are X amount that will be taken from Jim. There will be X amount taken from Dynex Capital. We're long term holders of the asset. And all I, you, so many of the conversation, either or. I am not talking from an either or perspective. I'm saying there is a role for each entity. Each entity should be viewed differently from a regula regulatory, but it should be a common sense to say, well, wait a minute, how much risk is really here? And it does differ by the entity, but it should be one of the, with the core tenets of a lender. I want my money back, and am I gonna get paid back? But the entities are different. And please understand the system as a whole. There's not enough long-term assets to finance 30-year, the amount of 30-year mortgages being made in our country. All right, I see a lot of nodding, so I'm not, we'll, I don't think you're, people are taking issue with that. Um, I, think, I think you've sold them all, so. Uh, um, let's move on quickly to uh, collateral issues. We've talked about a little bit. We said we'd get back to it, so I do want to get back to it. Um, are there classes of collateral that the uh, bank should take? I, a number of you address this in your written comments. Um, Lori, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I would argue that um, MS, that mortgage servicing rights should be eligible collateral. Um, it's the major, it's the predominant asset class that a lot of the non-bank servicers own. It's currently not home loan bank eligible. Obviously, mortgage servicing rights exhibit substantial price volatility. However, there is, um, you know, you basically lend, you basically lend rationally. You can put haircuts on it that acknowledge the fact that these are very volatile assets. And I would, um, and I would actually urge you to use, both extend membership to the home loan banks and allow for this asset class to be included with appropriate haircuts. Julie. Um, so maybe to answer your last question a little bit, um, I, um, as far as um, um, supervision is concerned, I would um, prefer um, that um, the members in the system um, be subject to prudential reg regulation. So um, that's a position from a financial institution. Um, we do hold 30-year mortgages. Um, all of us have different um, um, different strategies and approach to our balance sheet and um, the access to the Federal Home Loan Bank does allow us to manage our asset liability risk. Um, the, um, the other two points as far as collateral are concerned is I, I do think that the, um, the policymakers should consider um, allowing access um, by allowing guarantees on SBA loan, small business loans to continue on the loans that are pledged as collateral. Um, it is a quality asset that there's a, there's a fair market for. Um, and and um, currently they are eligible as collateral, but they do lose their SBA guarantee, which that um, credit enhancement, the loss of that, it doesn't really um, make sense. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the impact of unrealized losses in the investment portfolio, again, the asset held to maturity is worth the face value, um, taking a haircut on, um, and making um, that impairment to available um, collateral um, is also something I would encourage you to take a look at. Thanks, but, but does anyone have a view on home loan banks taking MSRs as collateral, even uh, with haircuts? I mean, is that? I think we support the position Lori laid out of of they they are 
a real estate related asset. They are a critical part of the housing finance system. We talked about this, right? It's really all evolution. We've evolved to that's a critical part of the long term holding, right? So I think we have also made comments about, well, some of these things are transitory. Owning mortgage servicing rights is anything but transitory. It's a major long term investment, both in people and systems and capital in order to do that. So financing or or having the ability to finance that through the system would be would provide a significant benefit to borrowers who take advantage of these loans. But just uh, just thinking about the mortgage servicing rights and how in said haircut it more, if single family mortgages say have haircuts in the range of fifteen to twenty percent, what kind of haircuts would you need for MSRs, and would anyone want to pledge them with those haircuts? And the the, the answer is. There's a market out. There's a there's a market-based structures to finance MSRs today. There's a market-based structure to finance Ginnie Mae MSRs that involves securitization. They have, by comparison to almost any other asset class, a very low level of leverage, sort of a two to one kind of approach. Maybe a sixty percent leverage that you'll get on Ginnie's. Am I right? Looking, right. Um, and and that degree of financing, yes, would be attractive to the system and would keep a substantial amount of skin in the game among the players who operate as servicers. And the, and the only thing I would add is even if on a day-to-day -day basis it's not the most attractive funding and maybe you don't want it to be the most attractive funding on a day-to-day -day basis, during a period of crisis it could prove invaluable. But that might be exactly it. I mean, on the, one, on the borrower, I mean, on the the person who holds the right side, but it could also be the most dangerous time for them to, you know, they're in the most need to, to get credit and they may be the, the, the most risky point at the time. But it's so, but it, there is a balance there. there I, there's I, a, I there's a balance and you can, and you know, there, there's a, they're, they're not, even for, during periods of crisis when it's very hard to, when the market seizes up, that's exactly when you're the most, when they're the most valuable. And again, there is always a haircut that works. Quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, the part that I didn't get with the MSRs, if, if this were such a vibrant market that you could loan on, it would already be in the repo market. And to my extent, people aren't using the repo market. So, be, so of securities that we're adding, obviously home loans need to absolutely be in there. It's what they need to be in. I tend to favor QCIP assets, rated assets, assets that have a daily valuation, some type of secondary market. In, in Lori's actual comment, she's pointing out the high volatility of the asset. So what's hard is how do you do a $100 million mortgage servicing loan and then it goes down to 20% in value and you need to shrink the loan at that moment by $80 million because its value is so volatile going exactly to the point. And that's why it's a hard asset to use in an advanced scenario. I, I, I get the desire to do it, but what it presents to underwrite the credit, arm's length, people wouldn't lend under that criteria. Like it, 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 it sounds neat, but I, I just don't get how it would work. Okay, so first of all, you there is, uh, you know, um, the, um, so first of all, 70% of the mortgage market in this country is securitized. When you securitize a loan, you throw off an MSR. So this is not a theoretical asset, and there are a couple of them out there, and aren't they cute? This is like a major part of the market. This is integral to the securitization process, and, um, and there is a market out there for borrowing um, against yeah, but, but MSR. The, existence, the banks, the the banks actually provide credit. The banks actually provide funding for... Sure. For, the, for these assets, so there is a lending market already out there. But all your comments are that they exist. Everybody who got, bought a plane ticket to come here today generated frequent flyer miles. That doesn't necessarily mean I'd lend on them. And I know that I there's a market to my, for that too. I know that I could, <laughs> I know I know that I I know that I could cash them out, but there's not an active daily interday market that I know that the loan that is already outstanding adjusts on a daily basis to the value of that. 
actually there is a daily valuation for MSRs, and I'm sure I, I'd really like Pat to answer this because I'm sure for, Look, I'm I, sure I, you guys I, mark your your MSR portfolio to market daily, if not even more frequently. Uh, well, I think the the more important thing is compare it to a whole loan, right? It has no different than the characteristics of the of the um, of a whole loan, a whole loan, a whole loan that is not um, it, it going to an agency security doesn't have a daily valuation or it has the same type of daily value. It's, da it's valued based on its expected cash flows. Same, same applies to an MSR asset, you know, and those type of whole loans, right, it, there's a tiny contradiction there in terms of if it's eligible for pledge to a repo, does that mean it shouldn't be eligible? Because, right? No, that's, no. that's that, okay. it, that works well because it, it, it says that, but the but a large portion of the assets that are pledged are whole loans. Whole loans are are pose the same issues of how do you daily value a whole loan, um, and the some of the advantages that the federal home loan system has provided is to provide financing for the types of whole loans that aren't necessarily as easily securitized. But the challenges of the whole loan are one: whole loans have to be in the system, and two, the holder of the whole loan or the issuer of the whole loan has immediate transparency and was already eligible in the system. So they're regulated, have a capital structure, and a complete understanding too. And the, and the MSR, we're trying to get the entity that's a non-bank entity that has the servicing rights to use that to pledge as collateral. That's different than saying did the original savings and loan and the original collateral that was designed for the federal home loan bank system if the original DNA was supposed to be a home loan should remain as collateral and the entity that held it was the uh, savings and loan. That was inherent and in exactly in the DNA of the system. So that's, but the hard part on this is trying to understand how does this MSR change and it changes materially at that time. It, it changes, right, I'm sorry to cut this off, but I do wanna to get to one other topic. Um, I mean, I think we, we, we take the points and we'll, you know, it's an area that needs to be um, looked into. Um, the prudential regulation point, if we're gonna let people in, theoretically, again, don't read into that, um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, and that'll that be in the, in the papers, you know, I'm letting people in, it's, it's holiday time, I'm handing out membership, no. Um, <laughs> in, if we were to let, and obviously the CDFIs are a little, Different, kind of, kind of, kind of not. Um, what? How do we make up for the the lack of prudential regulation? Um, Laura, you had you had one idea in your written comments. I don't know if there's others, but are there other? I mean, we talked a little bit about. I mean, one way might be collateral. One way might be um, advanced, you know, enhanced assets and uh, capital tests. But uh, I'm just curious. Are there other ways we can? Uh, we, we, we may be able to fill that gap. So. I mean, I would actually argue that, um, you know, for not non-banks, you basically say, okay, here's home loan bank membership, and that happens in exchange for prudential regulation. Now, argu now arguably, non-banks al already have prudential regulation. They're regulated at the state level. Most state banking authorities are really not expert regulators of these entities. I would argue, you know, and, and sort of, if you're a national mortgage company dealing with 50 individual states is um, a pain in the is is, is a sort of a pain in the neck and um, doesn't produce the best results. I would argue for um, I would actually argue for a national regulator. And furthermore, I would argue that the optimal regulator is um, the federal house is FHFA. Um, I know that that's not that's not at all on the table, but um, sort of the idea of a grand bargain of um, Prudential regulation in exchange for home loan bank membership makes all the all this sense in the world, and um, F and Fannie, Freddie, Ginny all have very very substantial information on all these bank all these non bank servicers because um, because essentially it's required to deal with Fannie or Freddie or Ginny you have to provide all this information so making the FHFA, the prudential regulator of these entities, would be very rational to me. Byron, go ahead. Um, the, again, I'm, I'm gonna go back to a diverse set of lenders in our housing finance system and tailoring the regula regulation for the type of activity, type of uh, asset that you're dealing with. Um, and I'm thinking broader for what's best for our housing finance system, how should you really regulate it? 
I can't say that I think you should regulate Dynex Capital like you regulate Bank of America. I just, and it's not a matter of size, it's a matter of, of what we, we really do. We are, we are really focused 100% on just housing and just housing related assets. So I would urge you, uh, when you say prudential regulation, it has a lot behind it, uh, is to, to, to try to be a little more specific with the type of entities that you're speaking. But to have regulation, I, to, to have access, and then have some type of oversight, I think is, is correct. You're a lender, you want your money back, and we wanna keep our housing finance system uh, safe. But part of the reason we're talking about is there any value in, in having a broader membership is because I think expanding the membership will actually make the housing system safer, to be honest with you. So it's what kind of regulation, the word prudential regulation, I, I think we have to drill down to say what ex exactly are we speaking of and why but if the prudential regulation is what came out of the OA crisis for Bank of America and other these big entities that could literally bring down the system, I think we should think broader about specifically what that regulation looks like. Okay, so Lori's solution to the prudential regulation problem is to provide prudential regulations. Are there any other ideas? I mean, I'm not, and I don't mean, the only thing that gives me pause about that, frankly, is having to choose between your kids in a crisis. Uh, do, do you save the home loan bank or the, as, but that's just me personally. I'm not No, I mean, I would argue prudential regulation is a matter of course. And in fact, you know, in many ways, I would argue that um, Fannie, Freddie, Ginny, and the warehouse lenders essentially provide that prudential regulation already all you're doing is formalizing it in a form that the home loan banks can more easily access. So why wouldn't they just create their own bank then? If they, if you're talking about having having um, prudential regulation, just would that be another way of doing it? Having, having, having them do this through a bank instead of as an independent mortgage company. Amy, I want to think I understand the question. You're saying have the... Well, if Rather I, than set up like a whole new system of regulation, why not use the existing systems that are that that already exist? Well, I mean, that's what I was actually suggesting well, that, is that, you've yeah. got re regulatory... You've essentially, Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny they're are essentially... Regulators. They're not regulators per se. They are gathering the information that a regulator would gather. Well, you need, you need to process it slightly differently, but that system is already in place. You've got systems that are tailored to these institutions. They are not banks. They've got a very different structure. And you've already got all the metrics to monitor them because you because Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny need it for their daily business. Julie. Um, so, um, so I like where you're going as far as the prudential regulation. However, I don't feel that Fannie and Freddie um, or any of the agencies provide prudential regulation for their lenders. Um, prudential regulation goes and expands much much further than that. So when I talk of, when I think of safety and soundness examinations by the uh, by the FDIC, by the Federal Reserve, by the OCC, um, much more significant as far as whether or not the entity itself um, is sound um, and operating appropriately um, in in the space. I also if if one were to go that route and one were to submit themselves to regulation um, as as um, all the financial institutions that are currently members um, are, then I would also suggest that they should also um, submit to um, to following the CRA requirements and making sure that they're meeting the needs of the market area that they are serving. So actually, I have done a ton of research on that. And I will tell you that non-banks do a lot more than banks in terms of serving LMI borrowers, LMI communities, minority borrowers, and minority communities. And I can show you the numbers. The difference is very, very substantial. And of course, the difference is so substantial because the non-bank lenders are those that serve the FHA market, which is where these borrowers are concentrated. I still like the, the question you asked, because that's exactly where I was headed in my mind, is setting up a new regulator isn't easy or short-term or cheap, and when there are already this many regulators out there and you are offering to be regulated, why not? I mean, what's your hesitation? What would be your hesitation into being regulated by one of these entities? No, no. I, I th I actually, I think we're, we're talking about something that's binary and then ignoring a lot, right? There's bank prudential regulation, right? And then there's state regulation, which mortgage companies are subject to and insurance companies are subject to, right? There is no greater prudential regulator other than a state regulator to protect 
um, policyholders for insurance companies. Uh, now, what Lori is suggesting is that for members who are actually active in the mortgage business, there's a substantially greater pool of data available to assess this type of risk than there is of the insurance industry, right? Uh, and that there's no federal regulator for insurance. It's state regulators. Some state regulators are stronger than others. Some have better prudential rules than others. But, right, and I think what we would say, right, than what had happened before is insurance companies were used to get access to the system. Right? So there is an existing regulatory structure. I think what Lori's suggesting is that there's a, that for this group of entities who are significant to the housing finance system, there's another layer of data that's available and another layer of control that's available that exceeds the regulation that would be required under the Act which the state regulators clearly provide. I guess I'm, I'm just trying to think, and we are just about out of time, so I apologize, I'll, I won't, I'll make this quick. If part of this is to, in the interest of stability, where disintermediating, for lack of a better term, the warehouse lenders, because the warehouse lenders pulling their lines presents some of the risk, if we are moving this to borrowing, to, to to enhance the stability, we're borrowing from the home loan bank. Aren't we removing some of the market discipline and surveillance? Um, and you know, and I'm sure it would vary case by case. But I just in, hear, in hearing, you know, we're, we're we're moving them to the to the home loan banks. We're relying on them now to do the work. The information's already out there. Presumably, the warehouse lenders are using that. So I mean, I don't want to be glib about it. I'm just, I'm, I am kind of curious. Like it's, it seems like there's a little bit of a tension there. Well, F F Fannie and Freddie have substantially more data than the warehouse banks have. Warehouse banks have our public data. There's the MBRF, which is a substantial level of detail, more akin to a call report or a focus report from the broker dealers, right? It's this level of detail, consistent across the industry, reviewed by them. So there's a degree of control that that's deeper, right? I think so there's two levels there. What do you need to have um, the right view into all the credit risk? You have that tool. What do you need to satisfy the version of the act? And I think you have state regulation. But so let me go, your other point was, I, I think, think back to the crisis of seven and eight. What happened? Banks were financing in the, through a variety of ways, and that dried up. Did it dry up because the banks were bad? It dried up because the marketplace froze. And the banks were able to access the federal home loan bank system in nine, 10, at levels that were unimaginable. And that kept the system functioning. It's the kind of thing we're talking about here. We're not right? that it. It's not that it was a bad asset that the bank was making, but liquidity dried up. Liquidity dried up for the banks, and they have access now. This segment of the system, which is a material part of housing finance today, and a particularly material part of housing finance to low to moderate income borrowers and in low to moderate income communities, does not have that backstop. So the day that the banks wake up and decide, hey, there's some other crisis that prevents them from financing, that trickles down. That runs the risk of trickling down to this segment of the industry. All right, well, the bad news is we are out of time. The good news is we are going to be having, at the end of this process, uh, another opportunity to submit written comments so you can save your vitriol uh, and <laughs> constructive <laughs> comments uh, for that. No, uh, but by, I, I, seriously, it is something uh, we expect, you know, as a gentleman made the, the point at the break that uh, you know, these roundtables are starting to build on each other a little bit and, and, and sort of the issues are getting a little bit more and more fleshed out. And so we expect that you all will have uh, responses and thoughtful things uh, in response to what you may have heard here or at other roundtables um, or we wish to clarify. I know we did not talk, uh, some of you raised even additional uh, collateral type issues revolving trust funds and municipal bonds, which we ran out of time for. Um, Julie, I did say we'd get back to your CRA idea, and we did not, so I hope you can flesh that out in, in writing uh, at the next time. So I, I think we heard a lot of interesting things. We are, um, you know, is there something about the differentiating long-term holders versus non? Um, we heard a, an idea about possibly a separate bank by, by entity type. Um, I'm not sure how we, there's just something to think about. Uh, the, the joint and several may create a, a, a an issue there we'd have to think through, uh, but that's certainly the kind of blue sky idea we were looking for. Uh, maybe modifications to 7J, differential pricing, differ you know, even more differential uh, uh, haircutting, um, which may, uh, you know, 
when we talk about mission, we may be able to do some different, greater differentiating based on the mission activity uh, could be something um, that's a, a thought. We heard about increased education uh, in, in requirements for members to, uh, to educate. So um, I think these are all the kinds of, exactly the kind of ideas we were hoping to surface. Um, you know, uh, so I do appreciate you all taking uh, some, all this time on a, on a holiday uh, week in, in the rain here in Philadelphia, but uh, there will be more uh, round tables in the new year. We are going to take a break and, and sleep for two weeks. But uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I do th seriously thank you all for your thoughts uh, as well as your uh, patience with us up here. So thank you very much. Thank you also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.